call the uh, planning board June 18th meeting open. Uh, there's quite a bit of correspondence that's been presented to us tonight. We may take a couple of minutes here to finish that up. <clears throat> if you'll bear with us a second here. You've got the minutes of the uh, May 21st <clears throat> meeting in front of you. Uh, are there any corrections or additions? Mm. On page two, the actually first full paragraph, the Dorsey proposed a two-story dwelling of roughly 18,000 square feet. I believe that should be 1,800 square feet. Any other questions? I move to approve the minutes from the uh, May 21 meeting as amended. Motion's been made to approve the minutes. Is there a second? second. Made and seconded. Do all those in favor? Show by raising their right hand. The minutes uh, are accepted as corrected. Uh, we have in front of us a great deal of correspondence this evening. We have a letter from 
M. Call regarding Blueberry Ridge. A letter from Cape Colonial Village residents regarding the Dorsey site. A memorandum from the Conservation Commission regarding the Dorsey site. A memorandum from the town planner regarding the Scout House. <clears throat> we have a memorandum from the Conservation Commission regarding Ram's Head Dam. We have a letter from S. Bushy regarding the Blueberry Ridge. We have an email from City of South Portland regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from Ash Bushy regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have an email from D. Sawyer regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a mem memorandum from the town manager regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a memo from the Conservation Commission regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Fulcatolis regarding Blueberry Ridge. And this evening, uh, we received further correspondence <clears throat> from the City of South Portland regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from the Town Attorney, Michael Hill, regarding uh, covenants of road maintenance. And we have a letter regarding the Dorsey property from Sweet Associates. We have a letter from Lee Bumstead regarding Blueberry Ridge. And we've uh, received the Letter from Michael McGovern, town manager regarding Blueberry Ridge. First item on our agenda this evening is the Dorsey, John and Sarah Dorsey request a private access way permit and a resource protection permit to create a second lot located at 146 Scott Dyer Road. The application was deemed complete at the May meeting. A public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-7-9, private access ways, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit. Good evening. Good evening. Bob Metcalf and with Mitchell and Associates and we're representing the Dorseys on this application. Uh, in review of Maureen's comments, uh, she made a suggestion here that maybe we just go over the uh, changes that have been made. If that's what the board desires, I can do that. Yes, please. Let me turn this so everybody can see. Since the last time uh, we had, had received the first round of comments from Maureen and staff uh, regarding some additional items that had to be looked at, one of those was to add the uh, property owner's name on the opposite side of Scott Dyer Road, and that was done. Uh, the other was to clarify the building window on the site and establish setbacks from the property line of the wetlands. Uh, we have clarified that building window to show a 15 foot setback. setback from the building to the wetland along the back side, and the grading runs down to the toe of the slope, uh, staying out of the wetlands and regarding towards the wetlands on the back. Uh, the other comment was regarding the private access way, was to add a note regarding the limited disturbance. That note has been added as note number 14 on sheet two of your plans. Uh, references the uh, limitation of uh, disturbance that was occurring. Uh, the other was a request that the sidewalk, uh, Maureen had asked us to look at preserving as much of the vegetation as possible on the westerly side where we're doing some drainage improvements. We will do uh, that to the best of the ability during the excavation work to preserve as much vegetation as possible. The other one was the Declaration of Covenants. We were asked to add within the context of the covenants the uh, issue of maintaining stormwater management and permanent erosion control measures that has been done. And while we're on that, your town attorney had made some comments as far as some typographical errors. There were two of them, and we will correct those for the uh, recording copy of the covenant. Uh, on the engineer's comments, uh, we requested a clarification on the radii and location of the 30 foot easement, access easement. We have addressed that. That note was added on. I think it was actually there before, but it was very difficult to read, so we've clarified that. Um, 
That also was the first 50 feet of the access road uh, being uh, paved and adjust the grading to make sure no water was crossing over onto Scott and Dyer Road and exceeding 5%. We have adjusted the grades to assure that we're less than 5% and the water is pitching either side of the driveway and not on Scott and Dyer Road. Uh, the issue was raised the last time about the standard turnaround requirement. Uh, we had met with Chief McGolder. Uh, the last time we were here, we did not have anything in writing. We met with the chief again with a letter which you should have in your packet. He reviewed the application again and the plans and signed off on the letter, this, our letter of understanding, and he signed that on the bottom. You should have that in your packet. And he basically accepted the reduction in the width of the travel way to 18 feet with the two foot gravel shoulders. The required turning radius and the length of the turnaround, 40 feet in each part of the T, has been provided. Uh, the other one was to show a uh, stabilized construction entrance uh, where a construction will serve for the access drive that has been added to the plan and the detail has been added to the detail sheet. Uh, the other question here was uh, concern with the eastern side of the parcel and the steepness of the driveway fill slope and possible encroachment on the abutters. When we were here the last time, we had already addressed some of those comments. And to achieve that, we've deflected the angle of the roadway as it crosses the new boundary line and coming onto the rear lot, thus pulling it away from the side property line and actually decreasing the side slope in most cases to three to one. We have one small area which is two to one. And uh, Mr. Harding had reviewed that and found that to be uh, in conformance with what he was asking for. Uh, the other was in regards to silt fence. We had silt fence on there. We've added a note and made that clear. Uh, that also responds to one of the comments received from the Conservation Commission, which I believe is in your packet, where they were looking to protect uh, any further encroachment into the wetlands. I discussed with Maureen what they were looking for. And our plan had reflected a silt fence around the perimeter of the wetland where grading activity is to occur, which essentially is the entire area of the wetland that was on the plan. It was probably just something the Conservation Commission may not have uh, realized was on the plan. So I believe that addresses what their concerns were. Uh, the square footage of the wetland impact has been added on note number seven. Uh, the wetland had gone up a little bit uh, in terms of the impact, partly due to the change in the direction of the, uh, the access drive and also in an area up in here where we did some, we'll be doing some modification to address drainage based on Mr. Harding's comments. And the wetland impact is, I'll try over here, now is 2,335 square feet of impact. It's up about 300 square feet from where we were the last time we presented this. Uh, there was a question on the uh, difference between the riprap detail and the pipe outlet detail. That has been corrected and Mr. Harding signed off on that. Uh, the removal of the existing fence showing where that would be terminated, where it comes across presently from this side of the property to this corner here, that has been revised to show where the limit of the fence will occur as well as new fence uh, on the property. Uh, it's a long paragraph that uh, there's a concern with the drainage that occurs in here on this site. And as a result of our discussions with Mr. Harding and our presentation to the board the last time. We've gone out and obtained additional topographic information to indicate how the drainage flows from the adjacent parcel over in this side here and picked up some additional information as well as spot elevations within the wetland. Uh, essentially, uh, what we had stated the last time is that the wetland in the middle is relatively flat. There's virtually no pitch to it. Uh, there's not really a defined channel for which way water goes. Uh, it's merely a case of when water ponds up and there is more of an infiltration. Uh, there are times when water may come up and it appears that part of it may come across the side of the property along Cape Colonial Village. In evaluating the topo on this portion of the property here, water actually flows in both directions. It's flat, but because it's rather undulating, and I don't know how many of the board members had an opportunity to actually walk the site, uh, but being rather undulating and not really with a steep pitch to it, the water does have a tendency of ponding and heading in both directions. Ultimately, it would come back underneath the drive uh, if there was a substantial amount of water for it to fill up in that area. Uh, to address the drainage, the last time around we had three culverts underneath the road. 
discussions with uh, Mr. Harding and then our consulting engineer, Les Berry from VH2M. In looking at the, the area for drainage, we side that back down to 112 inch. Basically, it's to stabilize the flow of water and equilibrium on both sides. Since there are really ponds on both sides, it really isn't a direction of flow like a stream channel would be. Uh, and Mr. Harding accepted that. One of his comments the last time around in trying to alleviate some of the problems that exist not only in this site but the adjacent parcels, there is an existing ditch line that runs across the back portion of the property, ultimately ties into a ditch line along the back of Cape Colonial and runs out to the marsh. And that was a recommendation by Mr. Harding to connect to that. And the last time I was here, we discussed how we were going to address that. And there is a high point in here. And what we're doing is providing a 12-inch culvert that will go through this section, the high area here, modify the grades here so that any hydraulic forces of water ponding in this area would be directed through the culvert back out to this ditch. That ditch will be cleaned out, uh, kind of overgrown in there, and that would take water to the back. Again, the evaluation of the amount of water that's coming off of this site, as well as increased runoff, is so insignificant uh, that this is more of a, an extra conservative measure to try and address drainage problems on both the abutting properties. By raising the grade here, any water that was migrating across this way would basically be directed towards that culvert. Uh, in addition to what we had done on field, uh, in the field work, as far as TOPO was concerned, we were able to obtain a copy of the approved plan for the Village Lane uh, private access way. And in review of that plan, and we proposed an approved grading on that plan. It appears the grading was never constructed properly on that site, which may have alleviated some of the drainage problems that occur there. And I believe you have a copy of that plan in your packet. And essentially, the way the grading plan had been done on this parcel was at the head of the wetland, there was a swale to be constructed and a pipe to run underneath the driveway for village uh, lane three and go onto the driveway. Uh, part of that was done. There was a small depression at the head of a culvert, which is nowhere near the size of the swale that was defined on the grading plan. The culvert goes under the driveway, has the proper pitch, but unfortunately, to get the other side of that culvert, the grade above the end of the culvert is higher than the culvert, so the water basically goes through and ponds on that end and is not properly taken away. Had that been constructed properly, you may not have had as much ponding occurring in that particular parcel. Uh, our evaluation looking at Cape Colonial, we were unable to obtain a copy of the approved grading plans out there. But in looking at it, it appears that there was some drainage defined that was to come across here and pick up the swale across the front of Scott Dyer Road where there's been through landscaping activities and whatnot, that swale pretty much has been filled in on this side, so it's relatively flat. So what happens is the water just stands there. The grades from the buildings, or adjacent to the buildings, all pitch back towards this property line, basically collecting the water down in here. Uh, Les Barry and I were out there a day after a, a rainstorm that looked relatively dry, and we started walking through the inner water, bubbling up through the grass at our feet. Uh, so that I'm not arguing there isn't a drainage issue out there, but it isn't all that's coming off of this wetland area. Uh, let's see. The, we also had Les Berry provide you with a letter talking about the drainage uh, the impact in that area and what we're proposing to do based on Mr. Harding's and uh, review. And we feel as though that has address some of those comments Mr. Harding had. Uh, some of the new comments that we received in the second round of uh, comments based on what we had submitted. Uh, Mr. Harding had raised the question about being able to have the access road cut across the existing leach field that's presently serving the existing residents on the Dorsey property. Uh, the letter that you received today from Sweet Associates from Mark Sancy. Uh, that system is designed for what's called an H20 loading to carry vehicles over it. Uh, it has a minimum amount of cover that is to be over it. We're actually increasing the gravel base that goes over that, therefore adding additional stability to the H20 loading that already exists the way the system is presently designed. Uh, therefore, we will be keeping the access road crossing that location. Uh, one of the other comments Mr. Harding had was in regards to additional spot elevations along the gravel drive. The way we've graded this gravel access drive is to pitch the water back towards that middle uh, wetland area. 
primarily the grades, drop down to a low point coming across to the wetland here, we're coming down to a point here coming across. We're picking up most of the grades to carry the water towards the rear of the property and everything up in this area is to drain back down towards the wetland area. Uh, another comment that we received is in regards to how the driveway configuration is set up. Uh, the last time we are here in the previous plan that you'd seen in the workshop was an offset of the entrance drive to serve the rear lot as well as serve the front lot in a uh, you know, more uh, safe circulation access, if I will. And his concern was that that portion of the driveway either should be relocated all in the 30 foot access way easement or we extend the easement. And we will extend the easement area. So that what you'll have is a 40 foot wide access easement in this location back in 50 feet to allow the access to continue on the way through. And I think that will address um, Senator's concern. I believe that covers the comments from the previous review and the latest review, review we had as well as the Conservation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Metcalf. At this time, we've scheduled a public hearing regarding this issue. And so I'll open the public hearing at this point. If there is anybody in the audience that uh, would like to discuss this issue, take the podium and um, introduce yourself, if you would, please. Good evening. I'm uh, James Webb. I live at 52 uh, Starboard Drive, one of the property abutters to the uh, proposed uh, access way and uh, lot. I, uh, since I'm the drafter of the letter uh, signed by 10 of the abutters, uh, it seems I should make some comments about that letter, and uh, I will. I appreciate the opportunity to do so. <coughs> The uh, 10 property abutters that are listed in the letter it's in your file, I think, um, <clears throat> are opposed to uh, this application, both for the access way and for the creation of the lot. First of all, because we think that uh, adding additional landlocked lots in uh, Cape Elizabeth is uh, not very good public policy. We are opposed to that. We are opposed to the uh, uh, alteration of the wetlands, which this uh, application proposes to, to do, and do not think that the uh, proposed remedies are long-term remedies for that. And we are concerned about the drainage off of this land onto the property of uh, the owners in uh, Cape Colony uh, Village Number 4. <clears throat> Let me then refer to some of the comments in my letter um, which make us opposed to this project. We've made both some specific comments about this proposal and then on the basis of this proposal we make some rather broader comments uh, which we like to make. Uh, the first one is that um, uh, the access way does in fact divide a wetland and the proposed remedy for that is to put culverts under the driveway so that the flow will be equalized. But over time culverts, as you know, fill up with sediment and weeds and we find no requirement or a guarantee that the town has that that will, will be a long-term solution because there's no covenant to the property owners to keep those covenants, to keep those culverts open and in good condition. There is a covenant, I understand, to take care of the road and see that that is uh, taken care of by all future property owners. But the piece which s seems to solve the wetland problem of the road bisecting it does not have a covenant and we wonder why not. <coughs> uh, the uh, planned septic system and tank uh, is located on this plan, and if I read it right, it will be about six and a half feet above the grade level of the wetlands, which means that the bottom of that septic tank will be just about the same level as the wetlands, and part of it is very close to that wetlands, uh, probably within the very 
limits that the uh, uh, regulations provide. And over time, there is certainly going to be seepage from that septic system into the wetland south of this property, or south of the building site, into those wetlands. In addition, um, the uh, nature of septic systems is to deteriorate over time and to overflow with hard use. And the plan proposes a drainage system, a surface drainage system that drains considerable water. Uh, if I see this right, down along this ditch, and if that septic tank overflows, the drainage water from that septic system will flow into that ditch, which abuts the property of Cape Colonial Village Number 4, and over time poses a problem not only of pollution but of odor. And we see no uh, solution to that problem offered. Thirdly, with the question of drainage bothers us, we're made very anxious by the recommendation of Mr. Berry, an engineer I think who was apparently employed by the landowners, who has recommended that the Cape Colonial Village number four be, quotes, encouraged to reconstruct the swale that uh, drains into Scott Dyer Road, end quote. We believe that a mem as a matter of equity, any and all necessary steps to present drainage onto our property should be the sole responsibility of the applicant. Does Mr. Ber does Mr. Berry's recommendation imply that the applicant's plan is not adequate in and of itself to solve the drainage problem. We don't know. On a little broader scale, this application and others like it raises in our minds, and we hope it does in yours, some planning and policy questions which the planning board and the zoning board and other town officials would it could address with propriety. The prospect of permitting hundreds of landlocked houses to be built across Cape Elizabeth under the minimum requirements now in place does not bode well for the ambiance and the quality of life of the future of this community or the property values of those impacted by the new construction. Surely it's, it's not sound planning to permit everyone with a big backyard to build it into a lot, another landlocked lot. It does seem to us that the time's right to address the urgency of this problem before it multiplies here at Cape Elizabeth and to provide that the creation of landlocked building lots uh, proceed with most strictly defined and uh, extraordinary, under extraordinary circumstances. This seems to be, I would think, a precious time to do that. If you noticed the elections last Tuesday in Falmouth, where the lady who uh, wrote a new Wetlands Act for Falmouth, who was opposed by some conservative members of the board, won her seat on the Falmouth Commission, and the others didn't. And uh, I think this is an indication that people today will support sound public policy zoning uh, regulations, and we think that these need to be increased here in Cape Elizabeth to prevent, to prevent the proliferation of landlocked building lots, as well as the proliferation of structures so close to wetlands that they are bound to have an adverse effect upon those wetlands. In Falmouth, for example, the new ordinance provides a 75-foot setback to the nearest structure and 50 feet setback from lawns and gardens and that sort of thing. And we have a 15-foot setback here. 
So I, we simply say that, and we hope that uh, we will be heard. Thank you. Peter Benson, Three Village Lane. We abut the, uh, I guess we abut the new property that they're going to uh, be building on. And one of our concerns is the wetlands and the water that is uh, in the front of our property now. Uh, we prefer not to have more water generated into that property. And, I'm, and I'm, what I'd like to do is get clarification um, as I understand it, there's going to be a culvert underneath the new driveway. Okay. And, the, and, the, and the grade of that culvert and the trench, as I face Scott Dyer Road, goes to the left. Would you prefer? No, it goes to the left. It goes to more than Scott Dyer Road. Yes, it would go. It's a relatively flat pitch because it's an equilibrium of water on both sides. Mm -hmm. It's a little slower than the pond in that area. So it goes toward Scott Dyer, it goes toward the village. Uh, it doesn't go toward the village. It's quite just that relatively flat. So what you have is the ability for the water to basically have a balance. Mm -hmm. So it isn't pitching it one way or the other. Okay, so it gets, it, it does what it does now. Okay. And the slope of the driveway. Uh, you, you talked about the slope of the driveway. So the cross slope of 2% that pitches towards the west on the northeast second part. Okay, so the, the, the pitch, the predominant pitch, the water would go toward the Dorsey property. Okay. And into that culture. Into the wetland of that. Into, into the wetland of that, sorry. Okay, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. My name is Ann Patch, and I live at number 56 Starboard Drive in Cape Colonial Village. My neighbor Jim Webb did a good job of talking about the technical problems that we see uh, with the Dorsey property. The last time I spoke before this board was uh, when Mr. Fitzpatrick wanted to build behind us in the midst of wetlands. And my concern that evening was about the quality of life here in Cape Elizabeth and the fact that that land in question was the home to foxes and pheasants and red-winged blackbirds. And it seemed to me that night that that consideration has less weight um, than understanding the difference between RP1 and RP2 wetlands, which I just learned about thanks to Ms. Elmira I spoke to on the phone. We here in Cape Colonial Village are among the least expensive, if not the least expensive, condominiums in, in the Cape. And we have the transfer station to the south, and we have the water treatment plant, and we have the electric transfer station to the north. And to the east, we have what we understood was protected wetland that could never be built on, according to some of the realtors that sold us our homes. So. The bottom line is that for me, just as a layperson and a property owner, a wetland is a wetland. It's a fragile ecosystem. It contributes to the quality of life, which is why I moved here. And I assume it's why you all live here. So I support Jim's work that he did defining the problems here. And I'm concerned too. A, a drainage has been a problem at Cape Colonial Village. And I think it is for the properties behind us as well. And to build another house back there, I don't think makes uh, very good sense. So I thank you for your time and hearing us. Thanks. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this project? Hearing no others, I will draw the hearing to a close. At this time, the board will begin discussion of the application. Ms. Shankland. You 
um, I know that there is a road maintenance agreement that has been drafted and is now with the attorneys. With everything I've read, I can't remember whether there is an agreement about keeping the culverts clean and the ditch uh, clear of debris. Is there one in process yes, there now? Is. Okay. Actually, it's already been done. Based on your comments from the last meeting, we've okay. revised that. Uh, that is in the attached package that you have, the new draft of the Declaration of Covenants under item one, maintenance of road. It does include uh, the additional comments uh, to maintain grading, stormwater management, permanent erosion, and sediment control measures, in addition to snow plowing, sanding, trimming of vegetation. That okay. additional information was added. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Metcalf, one of the comments made just a moment ago was about the septic system, and I was hoping you could confirm for us that the, the location where the septic system is to be installed has been per tested it and the system been has been designed per code? Yes, in your original submission that we had, you had a copy of the HE200 uh, application form. That was performed by Sweden Associates, and it has been laid out based on their requirements, their uh, okay. field verification. Okay, thanks. Um, on the uh, comment about the road being able to handle the loading of vehicles, uh, the portion of the road going over the existing leach fields, uh, does that handle the weight of construction vehicles that would be bringing in earth moving equipment and that sort of thing? Basically, they would have to work their way through constructing that drive and they would have to build that up as they're going in over the leach field. I guess what I'm looking for is confirmation that even with all that heavy equipment going over when all said and done, yeah, that's uh, what the, the existing system hasn't been That's what the been agency damaged. loading is to accommodate. Okay, that thanks. And I believe you made a comment about the uh, reduced width and the radius of the turnaround and all that the fire chief had had approved yes um, i don't i didn't see any documentation of that i just wanted to confirm that that, ha that has been done there is a letter in your packet which we drafted to chief mcgoldrick with a signature block on the bottom that gave you excuse me review the plan and signed off on that now i see it thank you mr Shrono. Yeah, a uh, question for Maureen first. Maureen, in your memo, the June 18th memo, the, uh, where you talk about uh, the applicant should relocate the driveway or expand the right-of-way so that the driveway is located entirely within a proposed right-of-way, has that been addressed in this it, submission? It, it hasn't been addressed in anything that's in front of you, uh, but the applicant, I believe, agrees that he will revise the width of the access easement to include the design of the driveway so that all you need to do is make that a condition on your approval if you're so inclined. Okay. And Maureen, perhaps you can just clarify the setback issue on the wetlands because it seems to be a point of confusion. Thanks. Yeah, there, there, and I did have a long conversation uh, with Ms. Patch. She was very um, patient with my explanation. Um, there are two different types of wetlands in Cape Elizabeth that we regulate, and there's only a handful of communities in the state that have local wetlands regulations. Uh, most towns rely on state and federal regulations to protect their wetlands, so Cape Elizabeth is already a cut above the rest in the aggressiveness of your protection. Um, we have RP1 wetlands, which are very wet, very fragile, and we have a 250-foot buffer that's attached to RP1 wetlands. Um, I met with the town of Falmouth two or three times when they were drafting their new wetlands regulations, and I believe their 75-foot setback is our 250-foot setback. Um, but I haven't reviewed the latest draft, so I, I could be wrong. Uh, and then we have these RP2 wetlands, which uh, most towns don't even protect as a wetland. Um, the state, in most cases, unless it's a very large wetland of, say, 10 acres, does not recognize and protect as a wetland. But in Cape Elizabeth, we treat them as wetlands, and we do have a level of protection for them. However, it's not as restrictive as the RP1 level protection because they're not as wet. We've, we've deemed them not as fragile, and we do allow certain activities in those wetlands with a permit from the planning board. Planning board permit includes a requirement that the 
the applicant demonstrate that they're minimizing the impact on the wetland, that there's no other way to avoid the impact, and there's only certain things that you're allowed to do, such as build driveways and roads to cross wetlands to access non-wetland areas. Uh, so that is what is being proposed in tonight's meeting. The board is explicitly given authority to establish a buffer for RP2 wetlands, but there's no specific uh, requirement for the width of the buffer. And it's been the board's practice with prior resource protection permits to establish a buffer in consideration of the limitations of the site. So this particular site, the applicant is proposing a 15-foot wide buffer from the, the building site to the actual edge of the RP2 wetland. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger for the town planner or Mr. Metcalf. I'm wondering, is the plan to expand the right-of-way beyond the 30 feet width, or is it to relocate the driveway so that it fits within the 30 foot it's width? To expand the easement from uh, 30 feet to 40 feet to accommodate to accommodate the driveway. That portion of the driveway that is outside the 30 foot easement. Thank you. Mr. Metcalf, I had one quick question. There's been some comment, <clears throat> and I would like your, your input on this as to how, your direction. I believe the chief of police suggested that because two property owners in, now will be using this driveway, that uh, because of that, um, there would be some requirement as to naming it as a street. Are you aware of that? I have not seen that comment. I apologize for that. You, the one that disappeared, I guess. Um, his, his concern is that under the, are the E911 regulations, if there are two or more homes that have access off of a driveway, you have to name it as a road. Okay. If right now you have one house that has direct access off of Scott Dyer Road, if you were to maintain that, and just build the driveway for a house in the rear, you wouldn't need to name it, and the current house wouldn't have to change its address. If you leave it the way you've designed it, which two houses coming off the driveway, you will need to name it, and the current house will have to change its address to the new name. He's also asking that you put the name on the plan. Okay. Otherwise, he needs to bring it to the town council for approval. Okay. Come up with a name, and we'll add that to the plan. Mr. Sharon. Yeah, Mr. McCaff, and the issue of the uh, septic system and the concern raised by the town engineer regarding the fact that the driveway will cross a section of the septic system, yes. has that been addressed? Yes. Uh, I've gone over that. Uh, you have a letter that you received tonight from uh, Sweet Associates, uh, which was one I believe Maureen may have passed out to this evening, which basically addresses the fact that system is designed with 12 and H20 loading to handle heavy vehicles going over it as a minimum depth requirement for gravel material over the top of that. We're actually increasing that depth to accommodate to meet the town road standard. Uh, so we're increasing the stability beyond the exceeding the H20 loading carrying capacity for that uh, leach field. Maureen, I'd like to make a comment on that. Mr. Seraldo, the, the code enforcement officer reviewed the suite letter this afternoon, and he said that the H-20 loading design would be adequate to be able to drive over it, not damage the septic system. Okay. you just review for me um, on the west side of the lot um, there's a culvert um, I know you 
mentioned it earlier, but I may, it might be helpful to all of us just to double check the flow. The way I look at the elevations <coughs> is the, let's say, the uh, north end of that culvert higher than the south end of the culvert? Yeah. Okay, so you have your flow from the, if there is a flow from the uh, wetland area, <coughs> it would go so to the rear the of the lot. Then out of that ditch line. Yeah. Okay. And the way you've got it um, graded, it it will not go to the front a lot, Scott Dyer Road. Is that correct? I understand it. Okay. What we've done is uh, to adjust this. Again, there's really no outlet. It's just kind of a continuum. It's wet along here. In order to try and alleviate some of those problems, if there's water that does pond end up migrates in that direction, we're raising the grade, essentially acting as a low uh, dam, if you will, even though it's not really a dam. It's more designed to direct the flow into that culvert. And again, the flow in that is going to be based on hydraulic pressures as the water, whatever level of water builds up, the direction is going to migrate. And once it hits that high spot, it's going to work its way down towards the culvert. And the purpose of that is because the culvert that's out on Scott Dyer, or the flow out on Scott Dyer Road is, is higher at this point. And it appears when Mr. Barry and I walked out there, and I mean, this is just based on our professional experience. We've, know, we've seen this happen before when drainage systems are put in, including swales. A lot of times, just over a period of time, as Mr. Webb indicated, in terms of uh, the culvert, material builds up and it's not maintained. In this case, it looks like it may have been the lawn, may have been expanded, and they're basically cut off any potential flow. Uh, it is relatively flat. And if I may comment to Mr. Webb's comment about Mr. Berry's comment, his was more of a recommendation to help alleviate some of the problems they already have there as if that were channeled, it would help get rid of some of the water on their property. And what we're proposing is to alleviate any existing conditions of water going through our, the wetland on the Dorsey property, continuing on towards Cape Colonia Village. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, Mr. Metcalf, on the road maintenance agreement. Um, it, the newest version currently only requires the homeowners to maintain the storm drain right under the driveway. It doesn't require them to do any maintenance to the, the back swale or does it's, it? It's including, well, let's see, including stormwater storm management. My interpretation of that is the stormwater management associated with the development of that project. And there's a culvert that goes under the road, and it would be the culvert going along the westerly side. Uh, right. If you feel more comfortable adding additional language in there, we can do so. It might help the abutters feel more comfor sure. comfortable. And the second question with regard to the maintenance agreement, it was suggested by the town engineer that the Dor Dorseys retain or reserve the right to have runoff from their northerly property run to the southerly property. Is that addressed in the new agreement? It is not addressed in that. Maureen and I had a discussion. Presently, the existing slope of the land on the front portion runs towards that wetland. So it isn't a case where they need the right to have that continue. If they were to regrade their property and want to pitch the water towards that, then there would probably need to be an agreement. But my understanding from what the town engineer is talking about is for the continuance of their water to go through. And Maureen can correct me if I'm wrong, but since it's already grading in that direction, we didn't feel as though it's necessary to have any language or legal agreement. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I think the town engineer was trying to be excessively cautious, which is a good thing. Um, but in, I, I don't think in practice we've required agreements to solidify existing conditions. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer a motion if there are no other comments. Please go ahead, Mr. Charles. And I offer this motion for approval having heard the comments from the the abutters and their concerns and uh, probably sharing some of the concerns regarding uh, development in Cape Elizabeth, but as best I can tell, this, this project, this application complies in all ways with the existing ordinances and uh, you know, therefore our job is to make sure the projects that are presented to us do so. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. One, John and Sarah Dorsey are requesting a private access way permit and a resource protection permit to create a second lot located at 146 Scott Dyer Road, which requires review under section 19-7-9 private access ways 
and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit. Two, a portion of the proposed driveway is located outside the 30-foot right-of-way and crosses a portion of the existing septic system. Three, the town engineer is recommending that additional spot elevations, headwall details, drainage right conveyance are advisable to ensure appropriate stormwater flows on the site. Four, the applicant has submitted a maintenance agreement which is being reviewed by the town attorney. And five, the application substantially complies with section 19-7-9 private access ways and section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of John and Sarah Dorsey for a private access way permit and a resource protection permit to create a second lot located at 146 Scott Dyer Road and construct a driveway that will alter RP2 wetlands be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated June 10th, 2002. Two, that the maintenance agreement be approved by the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Three, that the driveway easement be revised so that the new driveway will be completely located within the right-of-way easement area. Four, that the driveway be named by the applicants, subject to the name being approved by the police chief, and the name then be added to the plans. And five, that there be no recording of the plan nor issuance of a building permit until the above conditions are met. Motion's been made. Do I have a second? <clears throat> Motion's made and second. Are there any comments or discussion? Ms. O'Mara. I, I just want to clarify, by this motion, you have uh, required the applicant to comply with all of the comments of the town engineer, which would include getting that, that additional agreement to um, add something to the Dorsey uh, lot deed that says they can continue to drain onto this new lot. I don't think it's a burden for the applicant, but I wanted to make sure the board knew that with this motion, you are requiring that. Alternatively, we could amend the motion to require that they... Yeah, help me with the wording on that, would you? So I would, I would revise the proposed motion such that condition number one state that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his, in his letter dated June 10, 2002, with the exception of item number it's item seven, but it's not all of item seven. With the, with the exception of the last portion of item number seven. Is that clear enough to withstand the test of time? Yep. <clears throat> so you want to read with what uh, last portion that you're talking about, last sentence, last two sentences. And we, could, we could pin this down so we know what we're talking about. Also. Right. Would you like to reword your amendment, sir? Before we do that, <coughs> Uh, item number eight really isn't, it's just, it's, it's, I read that as commentary as opposed to anything that they would need to address. So it seems to me we ought to delete item number eight as well. Well, I think what we're saying is that they have to, they have to comply with the issues that have been raised, but not necessarily respond to the Okay. Because the engineer doesn't recommend that they do anything under another eight, he's saying we're not recommending anything. Okay. It wouldn't be a no requirement. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I try one more time? Please do. Amend condition number one to read that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated June 10, 2002, with the exception of that portion of item seven in the letter beginning also we are unsure dot 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 <clears throat> is that clear no are there any further comments or discussion Ms. Schenkel would you still second the motion as amended I'll, I'll second the amended motion <laughs> thank you any further discussion I hear no more discussion. All those in favor of the motion that's been made and seconded uh, show by 
facing your right hand. The motion carries. You have a project. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I may, I meant to comment this in the beginning when you were going over your minute and the comment was made about the square foot of the building. It was an 1,800 square foot footprint, two-story building, not a total of 1,800 square feet of building, square foot. But it said 18,000. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> when you said that, but you said two-story, I was going to just no, want to no. be sure. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Second item on our agenda this evening is uh, Everett Johnson is requesting a site plan review of the conversion and reconstruction of an existing building located at 1231 Shore Road to a 2,372 square foot office building. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. Bring us up to date, Mr. Fisher. Yes, good evening. I'm Jim Fisher from Northeast Civil Solutions here with uh, Scout House Properties, LLC. In the interest of brevity, uh, I'd like to uh, just jump right into, uh, with respect to the comments that we made last time, but, uh, right into the, uh, the review of the engineer's comments and uh, Moraine's comments uh, during this latest uh, go-round. Uh, first of all, one of the things that Steve Harding mentions is that uh, the board might want to take a look at, if you haven't already, had the opportunity to review the, the sign. Uh, just to make sure that that complies with uh, everything that we're looking at as far as the town center district is concerned. We certainly invite comment on that if anybody has any. Uh, also, he had indicated that uh, he would like to see a, a leader, which is an arrow uh, that uh, states that the northern section of the property right in here, similar to the section that's on the, the westerly line, also be loamed and seeded. And uh, we've gone a little bit further than that and added a separate note right up in this section it is exactly the same verbiage as that which is down a little bit lower, saying yes, indeed, it is to be loaned and seeded. This is the area that is currently occupied by a gra or portion of, a, of the gravel driveway. <coughs> uh, he'd also indicated that uh, it might be preferable to have some tip down granites at the edge of the, uh, the grand curbing that we propose along Shore Road. We've done that. Uh, the issue of street trees, I'd like to get you uh, to in just a moment uh, with respect to Marine's comments. Uh, we have added two inches to the uh, sidewalk sub-base construction and uh, two top layers of uh, coat to that. And uh, he also mentioned about the, uh, the gray-lined areas on sheet three of five being too light to see. Uh, that was in the reproduction process. You can act, you barely see them, but they are there. Uh, the essence of that sheet, uh, which he has reviewed, uh, is that which you can see, which is below. Uh, the entire idea was to gray out that section, which is just more for aesthetics than anything else. Um, but we have since darkened that as well. Um, that's, uh, in essence, the, the extent of uh, Steve's comments. As far as Maureen's comments, uh, I'd like to address the uh, several issues. Uh, first of all, that of the street trees. Uh, I'd like to preface everything by stating that this is not to be a point of contention as far as we are concerned. I would like to just pass out uh, again a couple of quick photographs so that you can see an example of street trees as they exist in the town center area, basically right across the street from us here in front of the, uh, the new uh, police building and then uh, a little bit further down in front of the uh, shopping center. Uh, this is an example, as you will see when it comes around, this is an example of uh, street trees that are well placed and uh, perfect for their situation. That being uh, to promote the eventual canopy or coverage of a, uh, of a road, i.e. 77 in this case, uh, to make it more aesthetically pleasing. What we have done, and, and we have absolutely no objection to doing something like that, other than, as you will see in these photographs, given the sizes of the oak trees uh, that are already in existence and which we propose to preserve on the Scout House site, that canopy is not only there, it's quite expansive, uh, going out actually well over Shore Road. Uh, so to plant additional trees uh, is just, in our opinion, an overkill. This is not uh, a, a a buffer, a vegetated buffer, as it were, that we're proposing in conjunction with, for instance, a subdivision where we're trying to buffer one residential property from another. 
uh, as it were, but uh, this is indeed a, a business area. This is a uh, commercial uh, building that we're proposing. And as such, given the existence of the canopy already, what we would propose is to not add additional trees uh, because the very essence of the architectural standard and the renovation that I'll get to here in just a moment is to draw attention to this building uh, and keep it in its in, uh, original state. And uh, by that means, again, given the canopy that already exists, we would propose simply that the street trees in this case, the much smaller ones, are just not necessary. One of the things that uh, Maureen did bring up um, of uh, substantial significance is uh, our, our preservation. We have proposed to uh, preserve, obviously, the trees that you see uh, and the plants that you see on site. And I've taken the liberty of marking those in green here. These are all fairly large oak trees. Uh, you'll see those, obviously, in those photographs as well. Uh, we'd indicated last time that we would uh, like to preserve those to the greatest extent possible. We certainly intend to do that. Uh, one of the biggest considerations in order to do that is to keep activity away from the trunks of these trees as far as possible with respect to any construction that's actually going to happen around the area. So toward that end, you can see the fencing that we have proposed around the bases of any of these trees that are near the, the areas that are to be constructed. And uh, in conjunction with the, the last time that we were here, meaning a couple of years ago with this project, uh, we also had a, a preservation plan at that time. And, and uh, some of the essences of that preservation plan, which have been added to this plan in this section over here, which you will see later. Uh, and this is from, a, uh, from an arborist is to, uh, in addition to the silt fencing, which is perhaps the most important because that keeps activity away from these trees as far as possible, is to add a, a biofeed emulsion to, uh, as a fertilizer, basically, to any trees or any plant life, as it were, before uh, disturbance, initial disturbance. Uh, the, any large roots, and large roots uh, in this definition are 10 to 12 inches you know, diameter root, a subgrade root this size, that instead of being ripped by a, uh, by a backhoe, for instance, or a front end loader, whatever it might be, uh, that it actually be cut with a, a reciprocal saw, for instance, a sawzall. The cleaner the cut, uh, an analogy would be to, uh, to flowers. If you make a, a clean cut on the stem, they tend to last a lot longer. Uh, if you tend to rip them off, just like you would rip off uh, roots from trees, uh, it doesn't mean the, uh, the flower, or in this case, the tree is going to die, but it could do some uh, untoward damage. So toward that end, we also have it on the plan that uh, any of those roots, when they are encountered, uh, should be cut cleanly. Uh, finally, the, uh, there are, are wood chips that are to be placed in the areas where any large mechanical equipment expects to be uh, working uh, or parked uh, on, a, on a daily basis to uh, assist in the prevention of compaction of the ground. So uh, toward the preservation of the trees that are already on site, uh, we have done exactly this and put that on the plan. One of the other comments was uh, about the, uh, the Rosa Ragosa that we uh, proposed to put in the back area of the lot, that which is dark shaded on your plans. There are uh, 55 of these plants that are identified on the plan uh, that are to go in this area. We can, certainly if it comes to it, if you'd really prefer, we can put the little circles basically that show where those 55 plants are. But 55 in that particular area is going to just be this massive circles. So we actually tried to simplify this matter. Uh, and it did not, was not an issue at the last meeting uh, where we had the same thing where we just proposed within this darkly shaded area uh, to have those 55 plants between two and four feet high uh, planted in that particular area. As you may realize as well, with Rosa Vergoza, they tend to be quite a profligate plant. And once you plant them and they take root, they tend to go everywhere. Uh, and you end up having to actually cut them back fairly substantially as opposed to trying to entice them to grow. It's quite good as far as a, a buffer is concerned. Uh, another issue that uh, Maureen had raised, and uh, I'd like to uh, just pass around a couple of uh, quick photographs. Again, these are of the Scout House. Everybody has passed these uh, past by the Scout House. Uh, this to give us an overview of uh, the front facade, uh, one of the, the contentions is that uh, should we make the front door more visible, uh, more specific, more oriented toward the public as, a, uh, as an access way? Uh, I, I believe we've covered that uh, both at the workshop and at the last meeting. Our contention as far as trying to uh, not only preserve but to, uh, to recreate this building in its initial context is to literally keep the doors and the windows and the essence of the siding, the roof lines, et cetera, as close now as they were then, and meaning when they were built. Toward that end, according to the elevation drawings that we submitted last time, that is exactly what we've done. So what we would prefer not to do is to enhance the doorway any more than it was originally designed 
which would really, in essence, uh, cause uh, any uh, pedestrian traffic to want to use that door as a principal entrance. And as we had discussed last time at the workshop, uh, we would like to have the side entrance, that, which is over here, uh, as after the, the principal entrance. And uh, toward that end, I would then submit that the, uh, the door, uh, the way we've got it designed, uh, should suffice. And finally, the, uh, the lighting details. Uh, you will see, and I, I do apologize for this, and the, again, the reproduction of these plans. What we tried to do in order to alleviate all the line types on here, because it started to become quite confusing as we were adding a lot of this, we took the, uh, the lighting details, and, uh, or the, the extent of the lighting buffer, which you see here in red uh, for all four lights, and we grayed that out a little bit so that you would uh, see it be less uh, specific on the plan as far as the confusing lines. We did keep the actual foot candle radii, the numbers that uh, exemplify the foot candle radii on those plans, and you will see those on your plans as well. These are the numbers that are here and over here and then down in this section. Uh, unfortunately, unless you really scrutinize that, you can't see the grayed out areas. What we did was uh, we did submit that to the, the town's engineer and uh, with the, the non grayed out areas, and uh, he has made his comment toward that end that uh, indeed they do suffice. And as you can see here in red, uh, they don't come anywhere near the property boundaries. As far as addressing those comments, that's the extent of it. I'd like to uh, answer any questions or comments that you may have and go from there. Simple question first. Where would I find the detail of the area where the door may or may not be? What plan is that? Um, the elevation plans toward the back of your uh, of the, uh, the packet that you had from the last meeting shows uh, the elevation details of all sides, including there in the, the there in the prior packet. Yes. Do you happen to have it with you? Do you have that plan with you? The elevation plan? Yeah. Uh, I, yes, I do. I have Could you just put it up? I just want to take sure. a look and see. At this time, you brought us up to date, and we've got a public hearing schedule. If we could, uh, unless you had any further comments, we will Answer discuss. In response to your own, I think we're all set. Okay, we will discuss it later. <clears throat> Thank you. At this time, uh, we've scheduled a public hearing regarding this project. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak uh, regarding this subject, please step to the podium, introduce themselves. Proceed. Seems to be a lot of interest in this, act, this project, so seeing no one here at the podium, I will bring the hearing to a close and proceed, proceed with the discussion of the application by the board members. Another just simple question. The photographs you passed showing the two oak trees, wh where are they on that? The two oak trees here. Okay. The question was about the oak trees that you see in the photographs, and those are the two that are right down here. So, I, Maureen, I assume then that the issue about trees 
relates to the area directly in front of the building? It, that... it relates to the esplanade that's located between the sidewalk and the road. And the recommendation from staff is to, within that area, between 35 and 45 feet apart, to plant two trees. Okay, and that area is more directly in front of the building as opposed it to... It actually extends from, from the, the east side of the property all the way to the driveway. Okay. Well, I was uh, going to actually address the same issue as well. Just looking at the photographs that you brought and then the, the site plan, my concern about planting a tree right near where there's already an overhang on Shore Road is that tree seems kind of uh, superfluous. Uh, I, I can see the need perhaps to focus on the planting of trees in the area on the site plan where there aren't any in the esplanade, which would be more in front of the building. However, that may interfere with the distinctive entrance that perhaps we're trying to create here. So I, I think we need a better idea as to where these trees might go and how, how they fit in on the plan. I mean, would the applicant consider planting trees in the esplanade that are further, I, I know that, further away from the existing trees that already create the overhang under Shore Road? Um, again, the bottom line is we can plant them wherever you want them. Um, but our contention, of, and, and again, please don't get the idea that planting a couple of trees suddenly is, is a contentious issue for this project. It is not. However, our only contention is that uh, given the essence of street trees and the reason for them has already been addressed naturally by the, the number of fairly large trees that we've got here. And again, our contention is that we're overfilling this site considerably. What we're trying to do to the greatest extent possible is preserve those trees that already exist. Uh, now, when there was an earlier question about uh, where the location of those trees. I pointed the, uh, we've got a couple of different views of them. Uh, there's also a fairly sizable one that's right here. Right? It's right next to the building that we also intend to preserve. So, yes, there is a little pocket here, but again, keep in mind the canopy that you can see from those photographs of those trees. They do grow out not only over the front portion of the building, but actually into the portion of Shore Road. In fact, this one right here grows almost across, or the, the drip line of it actually goes across Shore Road. So, and these trees are continuing to grow. Is it a substantial item? Not as far as we're concerned. We just don't think it's quite necessary in this particular case because the trees, the effect that we're trying to get is already there. I guess I might look at that as a little differently and think that these trees, if planted, would be the next generation of canopy since the existing large trees at some point won't be there anymore. Mm -hmm. 20, ahead of you. Or 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, when the small trees that are planted grow up, they may be replacing trees that are, that are no longer present. I, I, I guess that's how I read the ordinance, that it's sort of a, a life cycle thing. Sure, and, and that's a very valid point. Um, what we had discussed as far as that is concerned, and, and given the, uh, the technical capacities of uh, the Johnsons and, and uh, Scott House properties, given what you already see and the fact that they have preserved um, trees somewhat similar on their own property relative to this one, is that, uh, and it's easy to say, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it isn't, given the situation here and the fact that we're trying to make this fit into the town center district, with th those oak trees that you see on here show no sign, at least into the near future, of, uh, of dying or, or they're otherwise being diseased. Yes, that can change, certainly. Uh, the point is, when we get to that, that area where it becomes obvious that these trees are getting older and are going to die, we can simply try to replace them. If that needs to go into the, the esplanade now, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, again, we want to call emphasis to this particular section, right from the section here, to the building facade itself and trying to redo this and, and bring it back to its original grandeur and then we're popping a couple of trees right in the middle of it. Um, because as somebody had mentioned earlier, if we start planting them over in this section, an oak tree is going to grow just about anywhere as long as it's not a wetland area. Um, but with the canopy that's over this entire area, it's not probably impossible to grow quite as well. Long answer to your question. but. Uh, 
I'd like to say I'd be more concerned with preserving the existing trees rather than planting some new ones. I, I've looked several times at the facade, and I think the existing trees do the job. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carter. It appears like the frontage on this property is just a little bit over 100 feet. We have three mature oak trees along that 100 feet. I feel that's substantial enough. Mr. Sherrill. Um, I, I would agree with the prior comments on the trees. I, I'm not a landscape architect, but to put two small trees in front of the oak trees that I don't think would look very uh, balanced. And in terms of the area right in front of the building and the town center ordinance, I would suggest that given the small length of sidewalk that the prominence of the um, remodeled building would add to that particular area and doesn't need trees right in right in front of it since it's such a small area and I guess from that issue I'll go to the issue of the, the door or lack thereof um, I'm looking at the front elevation design which shows uh, granite steps and what looks to be double door, although I understand it's not going to be used as such. Um, without the ordinance in front of me, I, I would think that that's sufficient. Um, I, I wouldn't want to force the applicant to have to use that as the primary entrance of the building because obviously that wouldn't make sense given the driveway and the design. So the fact that it looks like a door um, I think would satisfy what what we're after. Um, so on both of those issues, I guess I'd have to say that what uh, we've been presented with tonight seems to fulfill the requirement. Is is that a drawing that? The sketch that all of us have, or is that something uh, that was we, we have it if we brought our plan from it's last week, which I unfortunately have my Go ahead. I just want to clarify that the preservation, tree preservation plan, Maureen, has been approved. Is that correct? Or has been submitted? I believe that portions of what Mr. Fisher presented to you this evening is not in the package. Okay, so the, the tree preservation and if, plan. And if I'm incorrect, if there's something you said this evening that is, that, that is, that there's nothing missing from what you said this evening that's in the package, that's fine. But I look through it and. I've seen other tree preservation plans and I've talked to some people about them and they say that when you do work within the drip line of mature trees, they can survive, but there are things that you should be doing. One of them is to make sure to cut the roots as, as opposed to just breaking them. But there's also trimming that should be done above um, in the branches and I'm not a landscape architect either, but I've seen more detailed plans that talk about preserving trees and in fact, one of the best ones I saw was the prior plan on the site for the restaurant. So that was my recommendation that we actually get a more detailed plan that talks about what's going to happen um, to treat those trees during construction and after construction. Mr. Fisher, you mentioned that, but has that been submitted yet or has that just been discussed? Well, um, sort of a little bit of both. You do not have it in front of you. Um, this came up as the, uh, um, after we had submitted the last time or this latest time. And uh, 
what we've done, I actually, at, at uh, both relative Marines comments, I called the landscape architect uh, with whom we worked, still do, uh, but last time in the last uh, section, and uh, he's very familiar with the project, and he suggested that uh, we call specifically an arborist, which I did. Um, and uh, you do not have that information in front of you. The arborist is uh, Ted Armstrong at Whitney Tree Service, and I spoke with him, and the comments that he made are those which you will see here, or Marine will see. Uh, and these are the comments that I stated before when we were talking about uh, in addition to the fencing that we have already proposed, and then the back filling of those roots, uh, the fencing around the, our trees, to be, the trunks to be preserved, pushing that fencing as far out as possible um, relative to the construction that's going on around it. And, uh, and then the back filling of any roots that are exposed, the smaller ones that need to be removed. Uh, he suggested the, the biofeed emulsion, which is spread on uh, immediately prior to basically stimulate growth, the clean cutting of the larger roots, those at 10 to 12 inches or larger, and then the, uh, the wood chips that would uh, go quite far to prevent or, or assist in the prevention of compaction around the area where major equipment is going to be used. But are these actually on the plans that we received? They're not, no, they're okay. not on the plans that you received. You. They're the ones that Marine will have to review. It, it sounds like you're pretty close to where um, the recommendations were going anyway in terms of having the, the detailed information. Um, but I think particularly if we're not going to be asking the applicant to, to plant esplanade trees, uh, we should take every measure to ensure the existing trees do survive. Um, so uh, one of the potential stipulations in a motion would be that a tree preservation plan is submitted prior to construction, which has been prepared by a main registered uh, landscape architect. Sounds like you got a lot of that information. It just has to be formalized. Uh, if I may, and that's fine, but instead of a landscape architect, I would, since we've already, I've already spoken to one who said it'd be a lot better to talk to an arborist, an actual tree guy. Uh, so toward that end, I would... Is there such a thing as a main registered arborist? I believe there is. <laughs> okay. I don't know if... We just want to make sure that the, the best expert that can be brought to bear will help, that, help ensure that... As far as I know, that's him. And we've already contacted him, and he is prepared to be able to issue a letter for me. My expert in the rear of the room says there is such a thing as a, a registered <laughs> tree arborist. Certified. 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 Certified tree arborist. Thank you. I could just weigh in on the front entrance issue. Uh, I think based on the plans that were in our prior package, uh, that would satisfy me that that would be a distinctive enough entrance. And I also concur with the comments from the, that half of the planning board. I think if we preserve the trees, that's really going to uh, adequately address the issue of the overhang of what we're trying to accomplish in the town center. I'll also weigh in and echo those comments. Um, I think trees as they grow might actually obscure the entrance as a front entrance so that you know it gets hidden and you don't know it's the front entrance. I think the placement of the proposed sign highlights the fact that that's the front of the building. It's right in front of the door, and I'm also all right to the door as depicted. Uh, one more question. Is it necessary, and is the issue of revising the plans to depict the location of plantings been addressed, or is that still? I think at a minimum we want to get a set of plans that so show the six rows of Ragosa in front of the building so that you can see them. Um, I mean, the, the ones in the back may not. The, the problem, when I look at these plans, I, I, I can hear the code enforcement officer in my ear three months from now saying, what does this mean? What does that mean? How come you didn't make this clearer on the plans? It'll be my fault. So we need to make sure that if nothing else, we put a big cloud in the back and something that says 55 Rosa Ragosa have to be planted within this specific area. Because right now, if you just look at it, there's no boundaries that show where the plants are supposed to go. And if you're sending someone out to the site to count plants, it could be anywhere. So I guess if you look at it and think in terms of trying to take this plan a couple of months from now and make sure that what you thought was going to happen was actually done, uh, there needs to be enough detail on there, only on the plan, not on any, any other comments that have been made, but it has to be on the plan because the code officer can't use anything that was just a conversation. So if the board is comfortable that the plans are specific enough to that extent, then they're fine. My suggestion would be that there needs to be a little bit more specificity about where things are supposed to be planted. 
Uh, do we need to put 55 circles on there? Probably not. Well, I, I guess that's that's my question because to me that would be the only thing left to do I beyond think. what's there because it says shaded area to be planted with 55 rows or go to 15, 18 inches. So beyond that, I guess that's what you'd have to do is make the 55 circles, and I think we all agree we don't need to do that. I think that's what I'm trying to figure there's out. There's other areas on the site plan that have uh, plantings identified. Um, if you look at the front of the building facing Shore Road, there's a couple of arrows that say rhododendron typical, rows of growth are typical, but it doesn't say how many or where. I think what Maureen's getting at, which I agree with, is that you know, just part of the final application, part of the final plan should show specific species, how many and where they're going to go. I got sure no problem with not drawing 55 circles. I, I think they were on the last plan and they didn't copy on this plan, isn't that correct? They are on the last plan. If, if you change. pull out your last plan, yeah. they're all there. Right. I think what happened was the uh, when we had what is 150 some copies of this of these plans made uh, is it my supposition I think the cartridge was a little light and when we got them back all folded in the pockets etc uh, we took them out and uh, the grayed out areas uh, again that which we made more in the background that were still visible on the plan are still visible on the, on the plan the final plans that you have uh, or will have um, they did show those specifically not only uh, in number but the comments uh, or the leaders at the bottom uh, indicated six uh, at the bottom and then the other 55 could be planted in that shaded area and does does that plan i didn't i didn't bring that with me tonight either i'm ashamed to admit does that plan also include what we typically see which is uh, species the size yes that location. section is right over here in that plan as well so maybe you can help me with one thing there's, there's that bulkhead on the side of the building yes which for physical reasons has to be there Yes. Does the landscaping plan include screening for that? So it yes, that's the there's not rhododendrons that are planted in front of actually all around it, with the exception of the actual opening in the entrance. So Maureen, maybe you can. I guess I'm. I thought I understood. Now I'm confused again. What is not depicted on the, the drawing for cutting landscaping that we should we should be looking for? When, when an applicant submits a plan, everything that has been previously submitted is considered part of what you approve. Everything that you get that replaces what you approve means the prior plan is no longer in effect. So if you approve a plan tonight, you'll be approving the one you received for tonight's meeting because it replaces the prior month's meeting. If the code, if I tell the code officer he has to use the prior plan for some parts of this and this plan for the rest of it he's going to be very upset with me and it's going to be impossible to enforce so when i make recommendations to you it's recommendations of changes that need to be made to the plan that you have in front of you and some of the things that showed up in the last month's plan that didn't come out in this month's plan need to be put back well i think we can i think we can rectify that by having a condition that the plans depict the locations of the plantings and then hopefully so the approval can go forward and then hopefully all Mr. Fisher has to do is incorporate on his old plan or whatever and submit it and that would seem to take care of everybody's concern. And the, the draft motion we have to work with includes that? Um, it does. Item number three, John. It's item number three in the proposal. Right. I, the, the thing I'm looking at is also in the, at least a proposed motion, talks about addressing the comments of the town engineer, and I'm looking at that to determine how many of them are still valid and how many have already been addressed. Um, for instance, the board should review the details of the sign to be sure it's in keeping with the character of the town center. I think the sign is fine, and perhaps if we can address that, then that's one less thing that's a further condition. Mr. Serraldo, it's that's one of those helpful comments he makes. In fact, okay. and it's a, by the way. Right. 
Well, there's, there's not no action we would ever require from the applicant. It's just something in his letter and the fact that right. you discussed this tonight would imply that you, you saw the plan for the sign and you were happy with it. Well, since that is something we're supposed to do, I guess I'm saying I saw the plans for the sign and I'm happy with it. So. Actually, the only statement that that I see that may be relevant and may not is number six. And maybe you've talked about that too, the sidewalk construction. Yes. So that's been taken care of also. Yes. And everybody, this, I don't would, really well, know. this would be the condition for the, for the engineer to be able to get back to Marine. Okay, so that is the only thing in this letter that is now, now appears to be. Well, everything has been addressed, but not on the plans from three weeks ago because he made those comments after that. So those are on the mylars that, for instance, you would then sign as uh, in conjunction with approval are those that Marine would have. We'll get those to her tomorrow. But the lighting is on the plans. As I read the plans, the mm -hmm. lighting seems to be talked about on the plans and the sign is taken care of. Mm -hmm. And the driveway is fine. But if we require him to comply with the town engineer's comments, but I'm saying already that maybe complied, really then, then I don't see the problem with making that a condition. Uh, right. I mean, it's already taken care of, so there's nothing else to do. Would you entertain a motion? Yes, please. Okay. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Number one, Everett Johnson is requesting site plan review of the conversion and reconstruction of an existing building located at 1231 Shore Road to a 2,372 square foot office building which requires review under Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations. Two, the site includes several mature trees in close proximity to construction that are proposed to be preserved. Three, the town engineer has recommended some construction detail changes. Four, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9 Site Plan Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Everett Johnson for Site Plan Review of the conversion and reconstruction of an existing building located at 1231 Shore Road to a 2,372 square foot office building be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a tree preservation plan be submitted which is prepared by a landscape architect and or arborist and includes specific steps to treat trees where the roots have been disturbed by construction within the drip line of the tree. Two, that the plans be revised to depict the locations of all plantings. Three, that the plans be revised to address the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated 61002 and 4, that there be no issuance of a building permit until the plans have been revised to address the above conditions and submitted to the town planner. Second. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Did you read the sec the first condition again? Of of the finding of fact or of the, the con first condition. Condition. Of, yeah. First condition is that a tree preservation plan be submitted, et cetera. Oh, that's the part. The et cetera is what I was trying to make sure I understood. Okay. That a tree preservation plan be submitted, which is prepared by a landscape architect and or arborist and includes specific steps to treat trees where the roots have been disturbed by construction within the drip line of the tree. Just uh, maybe this is nitpicky, but just to make sure we get the terminology correct, um, if you'd be willing, uh, may I suggest that you revise that to say that the plan be submitted, that a tree preservation plan be submitted prepared by a main certified landscape architect and or tree arborist. I think tree arborist is redundant, but that's apparently what the official term is. <laughs> right. um, fine. I don't think there's a flower arborist, but maybe I'm wrong. 
think the dimension was of a certified arborist, but I'm happy with the motion as originally. Either way. Uh, I, I'll accept certify although I is that a problem I mean is the person you have um, when I called based on I, okay it's I didn't ask I mean whether he literally had a stamp but uh, I was directed to this gentleman as the arborist so I'm happy with the original motion I, I would hate for that to be a stumbling that, point. That's if what I would say. We have a respected say. arborist who it doesn't happen to have the right certification. Right. I, I you know, I don't want the applicant to have to run around to find a certified arborist. I don't know how many there are, to be honest with you, but Well, I don't bring it up to be nitpicky. I bring it up because we're not requiring the planting of new trees apparently. And if we don't do the right thing to preserve the existing trees, then we can all regret the result. And so not that I distrust person that you're working with, but all we can do is, all we can live by is what's in the motion, and so, uh, you know, I just think we need to ensure that whoever's preparing this has the right credentials with it trees with. Well, I mean, I can tell you from prior applications that we've had tree preservation plants come from landscape architects. Right, Maureen? And I, it hasn't only come from certified tree arborists, as far as I know. No, I was suggesting that whoever prepared that would be certified, be they a landscape architect or a tree arborist or whatever. Would, would you like him to add the word certified then? Well, I was suggesting that, that uh, it's his motion. Well, I would like that, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Are landscape architects certified? They are. So the second term is registered. Registered. Well, it, if that's not a problem, I guess that's, that's fine. So we can add certified. You can be technically correct if you say registered landscape <laughs> certified arborist. <laughs> we'll we'll thank you, Barbara. <laughs> we'll take care of it. Any further comments? And the motion's been made, seconded. Um, are the changes on the second acceptable to the second? at this point. So we have a motion seconded with adjustments. Uh, all those in favor of the motion show by raising your right hand. Uh, you have a project. Uh, I look forward to this. I, mu I must make a comment that the Johnson's property is a credit to the center of Cape Elizabeth and I think this is going to be a wonderful addition. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. <clears throat> The next item on our agenda this evening is John Higgins, DBA, Ram Head Partners Limited Liability Corporation is requesting a resource protection permit to reconstruct two dams located at 20 Rams Head Road, which will require alteration of RP2 wetlands. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 9-8-3 Resource Protection Regulations. Mr. Chairman, I need to recuse myself from considering this matter. Any objections to Ms. Wolves? At this point, would you bring us up to date, sir? Chair Griffin, board members, good evening. My name is Stephen Moore. I'm a <coughs> landscape architect with Moore and Sheridan. <coughs> Excuse me, in Portland. Um, the project that we're bringing before you this evening is substantially um, what you saw at workshop uh, last month. What Mr. Higgins is proposing to do is to reconstruct 
the center portions of two small dams that were built um, at the beginning of this century. Um, as you may recall, we came before this board uh, four or five years ago for permission to construct a large pond and expand the ponds here uh, on, the, on the property. This is a 40-acre property. The existing houses are shown in black. The existing pond is here, and the wetlands extend upstream towards the Sprague property. What um, we have submitted to you are the soils informations, wetland delineation, and copies of the erosion control plans that support what we're proposing, which is simply to go in and reconstruct the small center portions of each dam to <clears throat> impound two areas upstream and recreate what were known as the middle pond and upper pond. In the information that we provided you in the packets, we showed you the details of what those impoundments would be, which are shown here in dark blue. With the center portions of each of the dams reconstructed, <clears throat> we'll be impounding uh, just under 5,000 feet in the middle pond and then just um, a little under 7,000 feet in the upper pond for a total uh, conversion of scrub shrub wetlands to emergent pond wetland of around 11,600 square feet. In the construction planning, we've worked through the details of this uh, very carefully because the concern is that's a tremendous resource in terms of blue flag iris, yellow flag iris, marsh marigold, and the streams as resources um, coming through this area. So what we've shown in our construction operation plan is that we'd actually go in, uh, set up an area just on the upland side of each of the dams, create a coffer dam, pump the water around, and then excavate just in the area where the dam center would be reconstructed, pour the concrete to the new weir, construct the new weir, then backfill with the excavated material. Our actual impacts for the two dams for that construction is right around 500 square feet. When we're done, <coughs> excuse me, what we're looking at would be the recreation of two very, very shallow uh, ponds in that stream. So the stream channel would remain over 140 feet of its length. 220 feet of the stream would disappear to become parts of the pond. And the pond vegetation would remain 95% intact. There are five clumps of alders, which we would pull out, and then one small clump of um, raspberries that we're pulling out for a total um, disturbance inside those existing wetlands of 75 cubic feet, or just over 100 square feet of actual impact of vegetation. The rest of that vegetation we're leaving because after impoundment, um, right at the newly built dams, we'll have just about two feet of water. But because of the shallowness of that area and the low gradient, um, the average depth on that pond is only going to be about eight inches or nine inches. So again, the majority of that vegetation in that wetland will remain, <clears throat> and we'll have small bodies of water down near each dam breast. And then there'll be about an 18-inch drop of water from um, the weir plate back down into the old stream channel. Um, when we're done, what we're looking for is really to recreate those historic ponds, but also perform the functions that are outlined in our submission to you, which are um, take out some of the fines and sediment that are in the stream and make their way into the large pond, and thereby um, retain water quality in the lower pond. It'll improve um, the habitat in terms of changing that diversity a little bit as you move up through each of the ponds. And then we get some scenic, aesthetic, and maintenance benefits as well from those small impoundments. Um, Maureen has done a good job in her memo summarizing uh, compliance with those various conditions. <clears throat> the only thing I don't have for you tonight, which I promised to you last time, um, we approached Sprague Corporation to seek a letter in writing because our impoundment extends about 22 feet onto the Sprague Corporation land. Um, what we've gotten to date is um, the recommendation from John Green, who manages the property, that that impoundment was fine and acceptable. We don't have anything in writing. And so what I would offer to the board is because we don't have um, a bona fide for you to address that impoundment onto um, the Sprague land, we feel it's important to lower the water. We need to lower that water elevation by about four inches so that we don't impound onto the Sprague land. 
So again, I believe that the board's discretion. Our <clears throat> suggestion tonight is that you can either condition this upon receipt of the letter or we'll simply say we're going to lower the water elevation six inches from the current design elevation of 21.0 to 20.5 and therefore there will be no impoundment on the spray property. Um, but we I offer that to you because we thought we'd get something in writing we haven't and all we have is a oral representation from John um, and that may not be sufficient for the board to feel comfortable allowing that impoundment to occur. So our solution to it was to simply lower that water elevation down to 20.5 and not deal with the impoundment issue on. Um, but that option is there for the board to consider. With that, I think that <clears throat> addresses all of the issue. Fortunately, we don't have noise and parking and those sorts of things with this plan tonight. So I'll turn it back to the board for <clears throat> review for completeness in a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, uh, we need to discuss the completeness of this project. Are there any comments regarding it? If there are no Mr. comments, I have a motion for the board to consider. I hope I'm not jumping the gun. No. <laughs> a motion for the board to consider, uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and material submitted and the facts presented, the application of John Higgins, DBA Rams Head Partners Limited Liability Corporation, for a recess protection resource protection permit to reconstruct two dams located at 20 Rams Head Road, which will require alteration of RP2 wetlands, be deemed complete. We have a motion. Do I hear a second? Motion's been made and seconded. Do I hear any comments? Any discussion? And I'll bring it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front, show by raising right hand. At this point, the uh, application is deemed complete by the planning board, at which time we would like to have a public hearing. Uh, so I will open a public hearing and recommend anybody that would like to speak on this issue to address the podium. Seeing no one interested in speaking, I will draw the uh, hearing to a close and proceed with our further discussion uh, of the project. Yes, Mr. Sherman. In the presentation, you, you mentioned the, the two possible conditions that the applicant would be willing to abide by. Is there a negative impact to lowering the elevation to the, to the upper pond to 20.5? <clears throat> there is no negative impact to that, and that's why my feeling is that that would be the better condition that we would like to see because it's a simpler condition that can be complied with, but it doesn't preclude the applicant if they ever get a letter from Sprague simply coming back, discussing the video, and then putting another board in the weir plate and pushing that elevation up. So it, it, we're really very comfortable just simply saying that the one change to the plan will be that the upper pond water elevation will be 20.5, not 21. What if we made it an alternative condition? You could do either the 20.5 elevation or uh, that's 22, provided you receive a letter of permission from the Spray Corporation. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. That way you wouldn't have to come back. Thank you. Anybody concur with that, Eric? Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have one question. Uh, Mr. Moore, are you a registered landscape architect? <laughs> I am a registered landscape architect, but I am not a certified arbor. <laughs> <laughs> We worked together often in the past. I just, I just never knew that. Just checking. <laughs> Mr. Schrader. Uh, make a motion. Findings of fact. Well, motion for approval. Findings of fact. Number one. John Higgins, DBA, Ramshead Partners Limited Liability Corporation is requesting a resource protection permit to reconstruct two dams located at 20 Ramshead Road, which will involve alteration of our wetlands. Require review under Section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Number two, the project requires a Natural Resources Protection Act permit to remain DEP. Number three, 
the application is substantially complies with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based upon the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of John Higgins DBA Ramps Head Partners Limited Liability Corporation for a resource protection permit to reconstruct two dams located at 20 Ramps Head Road, which will require operation of Article 3 wetlands, be approved subject to the following conditions. Number one, that a copy of the NRPA permit be submitted to the town planner prior to any alteration of the site. Number two, and Dave might have to help me with this, that the water elevation of the upper pond be 20.5 feet. Be limited to 20.5 feet. Inches? Inches. I'm sorry. Inches. Yeah. Yikes. Or any alternative, if it exceeds 20.5 feet, that a... Inches. 20.5 inches, that a letter be obtained from... It's very clear. Well, what did we say? The abutting property owner. Yes. From the abutting property owner providing permission for the impediment. Can I try one and see if you like it? Go ahead. I'm offering this as a reworded version. Rather than us specifying elevations, what if we just say that the plans be revised such the impounded water in the upper pond does not encroach on abutting property, or that the applicant obtain written agreement from the abutting property owner allowing such encroachment? Does that work for you? I guess we'll take that idea. That's fine. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then I'll put it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please show by raising your right hand. Motion carries. Thank you, board members. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Next item on our agenda this evening is the Joseph Fastacci requesting a final subdivision approval and a resource protection permit to construct Blueberry Ridge, a 19-lot subdivision located off Mitchell Road. The plan received preliminary approval in April. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 16-2-4, Major Subdivision Review, and Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Permit. The applicant to bring us up to date at this point, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Applicant's representative. Excuse me? The applicant's representative. Thank you. My name is Dave Camillo. I'm a civil engineer with Land Use Consultants here on behalf of Mr. Fastacci, who's also here this evening. And also with me is Tom Emery from our office, who is a licensed landscape architect, who will be talking about the buffering and the tree issues when I get through. I'm not going to go through all of the minor revisions that we've made, which are several. The town engineer had a long letter, which included many specific details that he wanted changed on these plans, which we have worked very closely with Richard Manthorne, who was also involved in the earlier phases of this project and still remains involved in certain of these plans. He is the person who created. So we have those in our set, and I'm going to touch on some of the issues and touch on some of what I consider to be 
the, uh, the salient um, the points that we, we've addressed in our revisions. Um, sheet one, which is is one of Manthorne's plans, which is going to be the recording plan for the subdivision. Um, we've added some notes, which were requested by uh, the town's engineer and also by um, the, uh, the town planner. Um, there's a lot grading note that um, basically says that none of these lots, when they're graded, will impede the drainage from the abutting um, lots, mostly in South Portland, particularly those on Gowdy Street. Um, we have spent a great deal of time uh, designing a drainage system to accommodate that runoff from the backyards of those lots. And uh, the point of that note is that when these lots are actually developed and graded, that that drainage system will be maintained. That drainage won't be impeded. Um, that note is on both sheet one and sheet eight of the drawing set. Um, we've also added a note that um, all the first floor elevations will be um, at least three feet above the, uh, the road centerline grade in front of those lots. The point of that being that all these lots will be designed so that they will grade to the street so that all of the stormwater that runs off of these lots will run to the street and not towards the abutting properties. Um, we've also designated that the lots numbered 1, 2, 12, and 19 are considered to be the um, affordable lots. And the way that's going to work, there'll be two of these lots that will actually be um, sold to what would be a qualified individual who meets the, um, the affordable um, criteria for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, we've also made a um, adjustment to the, uh, the net density calculation, which is, um, I believe it's on, on sheet one of the drawings, which uh, actually says on the drawing 49% of the site is um, going to be dedicated as open space that number actually needs to be corrected to 48%, and we will be making that um, minor correction in a, um, a future submission. There was a um, minor adjustment that came up at the last minute, and we didn't have time to make the correction before the plans were printed. Um, the, uh, the, the, the issues to do with stormwater that um, a lot of the neighbors have been concerned about um, we have um, spent considerable time uh, dealing with um, a lot of them were were uh, contained in a letter by uh, an engineer that was um, working for the abutters um, Steve Bushy and uh, a question that he raised and uh, we uh, we had not taken a look at this and, and uh, uh, it, it, it was a valid point the total impervious area that this site is going to create is 1.05 acres and there is a um, DEP stormwater law that requires that they review projects that create anything over one acre of impervious surface. So we cross that threshold ever so slightly, but we do agree and we have in fact filed an application with the Department of Environmental Protection for a stormwater permit. So that is in the process. Um, that's a, a potentially a 60 day review period. So that has started and uh, as soon as we have um, that permit. We will make it available to, uh, to the town. Um, there was a question raised by um, the abutter um, named Flocatulis, who, uh, who is um, located right here on Mitchell Road, and our retention basin is on two sides of her property. One of the issues that um, that was raised is the fact that we have what we call an emergency spillway in our detention basin system. It's a standard requirement for all detention basins and what the purpose of that is is if, if there is an extremely um, severe storm and it exceeds the capacity of the outlets of the detention basin, what we consider the primary outlet, that is a way for the water to, to pass out of the, uh, the detention basin and that happens to be located behind um, the Flock of Tula's property. There is an existing swale there which receives all of the runoff from this site now that leaves the wetland. Um, there was a concern expressed in the letter that this would be um, an issue in terms of additional flow being directed to this swale. The fact is that um, there will be no water entering 
that swale or crossing the spillway until we receive a storm that's in excess of a hundred year storm. Um, you know, based on our engineering calculations, we can contain the water from a hundred year storm totally within the detention basin system and it won't reach the level of the emergency spillway. So I just wanted to make that point because uh, there seems to be some misunderstanding that there's going to be storm water from this project that's going to be leaving through the existing swale across the backyards of um, the, the, uh, the abutter Flocatulus. And that, that, that isn't absolutely never going to occur, but the kind of a storm that we're talking about that would cause that to happen would be something on the order of, a, I, would, I would consider only a hurricane to be the only kind of thing that could produce the amount of rainfall that that would require, which would be something on the order of seven inches of rain within a 24-hour period. Um, so I guess our, our feeling is that for the majority of the time, there will be no impact there, but there is a rare possibility that that could occur at some, at some, uh, at some point. Um, the, uh, the issue of the Charlotte Street um, catch basin has been raised by um, Mr. Bushy. Um, we have um, in our design uh, basically diverted a lot of the existing um, drainage away from that particular location. Under the natural existing conditions of the site, it's um, approximately 2.4 acres based on the topography that, that would drain off into that general direction. Um, some of it may enter the catch basin, um, some may um, just basically pond because the site is relatively flat in that location and basically um, percolate into the ground. Um, by grading the site and developing these lots and putting in the storm drainage system in the roads, we're going to actually redirect approximately um, 1.6 acres of that area and divert it into our stormwater collection system within the roadways, which will leave about eight tenths of an acre that still is going to continue to drain in that direction naturally. Um, there isn't going to be much happening there, but it's still, just because of the way that the, the, the land is uh, in this natural state, will continue to flow in that direction. Um, it, it's, it's reduced basically in half. Um, you know, we are cutting the, uh, the amount of water that might flow in that direction by about 50%. Um, there was some suggestions made. Um, the town engineer suggested this, and we've um, had some discussions with um, Ms. O'Meara about this, of building a berm and uh, putting in another inlet to the storm drainage system there. We can do that, um, and if, if, if that's the, uh, the wishes of the board, we certainly would do that. It, it's our opinion that it's unnecessary, um, and it also, in our opinion, would, would th there's, there's um, pros and cons, if you will, and, and basically the, the negative impacts would be that we would probably have to do a little bit of blasting to create the swale to accept that stormwater, as well as probably cut some trees. Um, we, we intentionally made the building window on, on lot 12, which is the lot that, that faces the end of Charlotte Street. We, we put a 25-foot setback on that lot as opposed to 20 feet, which all the other lots have, to preserve as many of those trees in the back as we could. Um, we don't feel that in this particular case, we are certainly not adding any drainage to this area. We feel we're reducing it significantly, and the small amount that remains going in that direction, um, what little might get to the street and into the, the storm drainage system, we feel is, um, is not significant and doesn't warrant this, this sort of um, effort. Um, so I, I guess my point being, I am sort of looking to you as a board to give us some guidance on that one. If, if, if that's your wish, we will, we will go ahead and, and make a revision to the plan, add another um, drainage inlet between lots um, 11 and 12, and uh, excuse me, 12 and 13, and uh, put the berm along the, uh, the common property line with um, the, uh, the lots at the end of um, Charlotte Road. Um, we prefer not to, but um, it's certainly doable. It's, um, it's not a huge issue from our perspective, but we know that the abutters are concerned about trees and buffering. So, I mean, in this sense, um, we may be uh, solving a perceived drainage problem, but we're also going to be reducing the amount of existing trees and vegetation there. So, um, I, uh, 
I guess I, I, I'd like to hear from the board on that as far as what your thoughts are, and uh, we'll certainly, um, you know, honor those. Um, there were a couple other um, questions that were raised last time. There was a concern about blasting, and uh, we, uh, we will be responsible for any um, any issues that come as a result of blasting. Um, the contractor will be required to um, do the, uh, the pre and the post blast surveys. They all, as a, as a matter of course, um, in this day and age, monitor their blasting with um, they uh, have seismographs and they do, you know, very carefully size their charges and so forth so that they can reduce the, um, the amount of uh, ground acceleration so that uh, there won't be any damage to any of the abutters. Um, there was also a question about radon gas. And um, as a general rule, Mr. Fustashi, who is a builder, has built many homes. Um, this is an issue that's been around for some time. Radon is an odd, odd thing that you, you can't tell if you've got radon until after you've constructed the building. So what, what he does is he puts in a system that is underneath the, the basement slab that is a, consists of a series of pipes. And once the house is constructed, if it tests for radon, then that, that system can be vented to the outside air and it can remove the radon so that it is not an issue. Um, he does that as a standard practice on all of his um, foundations, so that is what he's planning to do here. So um, if there is an issue with radon, that'll be dealt with through the, uh, the, the venting system, essentially. Um, th there's been a lot of talk about the, uh, the, the open space zoning, and uh, I did include something in the packet that um, talked to that issue. Um, I guess the point that um, the, the abutters seem to be concerned that, that this is a very dense development and our setbacks are um, relatively small. There was you know, reference to a 50-foot requirement in the setback um, for this zone, but because we're using the open uh, space, uh, the open space uh, zoning, we've, we've had that reduced to 20 feet. And I provided a comparison in there um, just, just so that there was some, some way to look at this compared to the existing neighborhood. And um, our lots in general um, are, I think the, uh, excuse me for a second while I find the, uh, my notes on that, but um, what, uh, what we have done is um, we have, we have created lots that um, in general meet the standard that none can be smaller than 7,500 square feet and they cannot on average exceed 9,000 square feet. Our lots average, um, our, our, our lots range from 7,581 square feet, the smallest on lot one, to um, 11,939 square feet, which is the largest one, lot 11, and the average um, size of the lots is 8,848 square feet. And if you compare that with the, um, the abutting lots, which um, are here on the South Portland side, generally they, they range from uh, 5,227 square feet for the smallest to um, 11,325 square feet for the largest, and their average is 7,318 square feet. So our average lot size is about 1,500 square feet larger than the average lot size um, of the lots that abut us. And as far as the actual um, setback goes, um, all of our building windows have 20 feet of setback, with the exception of lot 12, which I mentioned, which has 25 square feet. Um, the abutting lots um, on, on Gowdy Street, they, they have setbacks from our property line that range anywhere from 10 feet to 35 feet, and their average is 23 feet, so it's relatively um, similar, and they is also have um, three three lots that have backyard sheds, which are three feet and four feet from our line, and there's actually one shed that's over the line onto our property by four feet. So, um, I guess the point of that is that um, we feel that this is no um, no more dense, and it's actually a little bit less dense than the abutting lots that um, we're build, building up against. And um, you know, one 
simplistic way to look at this is if you just take the lots on the, uh, the north side of uh, Blueberry Road and count them, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lots. And if you count the houses on Gowdy Street that are directly opposite, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So um, a simple way to look at it, we have seven homes where there's nine on the, uh, the other side of the line. So I mean, that's, that's the point that I wanted to make there, that um, the idea that this is somehow not in keeping with the neighborhood, we feel that it's very much in keeping and very similar to the existing character of the neighborhood. Um, I guess with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom now, and he can talk a little bit about some of the buffering in the, uh, the landscaping and the tree issues, and, uh, and entertain your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Emery. I'm not a certified arborist. Uh, I believe the closest I can come is an arborist arborist that I saw on Mighty Monty Python about 20 years ago, but in terms of redundancy. Um, I'm a registered landscape architect. Um, the purpose of this evening's presentation, I believe, is for completeness for final uh, subdivision uh, review. And what we've done is prepared uh, an update of the buffering plan, most of which are clarifications. And I've also had the pleasure of meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Samorian, uh, who are out at near Mitchell Road or on Mitchell Road, and were very kind to uh, interrupt their dinner. Uh, I walked the edge of their property, the, the abutting line, and we had a wonderful, probably one hour discussion about their buffering requirements, his world travels, my world travels, which were by comparison uh, much different. But uh, it was a wonderful evening, and, and I enjoyed the process very much. This plan uh, was the one that was approved as preliminary subdivision approval and, and some of the questions that were raised is clarification of the fencing and some of the buffer areas. When we resubmitted the plan, we created a, a key for the fencing and those lines are black, the property lines are black, so it's very difficult uh, to see, but these lines are exaggerated in width to help identify it. Uh, we've colored those in red here. This is a six-foot stockade fence. There's a six-foot stockade fence behind lot 17, behind parts of lot 14, behind lots 13, 12, and along the edge of lot 11. Uh, at the Samorian parcel here, we, were, we agreed to preserve the existing uh, sugar maple that's at the end of their lot line just inside uh, Mr. Pistacci's property. We're going to add, which we had in the prior plan, uh, flowering broadleaf evergreens, rhododendrons, and azaleas. Uh, and then they gave me a list of plants. Which they said were, was a, a palette of plant, plants that they would like to see even have his card here. Uh, and they included white li lilac, French or dark lilac, hydrangea, rhododendron, azalea, viburnum, rosa rugosa, cherry tree, flowering apple, dogwood, and, and magnolia. So from that list, we are adding, uh, we have up here, we have keyed in, it's hard to read, but Uh, one white lilac, three French lilac, uh, the saucer magnolia, rosa rugosa, and crab apple. The purpose of this plan is we've left all of the rendering out from the, the lots themselves, and we've colored all of the street trees one color. But we're, we're hopeful that at least uh, perhaps from the television or from the audience uh, that want to take a look, that you can see the extent of the mixed evergreen buffer uh, between the adjacent lots along the side of Flocatulis's lot, uh, accenting the uh, detention area, uh, offsetting it, 
And we've added in, uh, which was in the original plan, weeping willows to more naturalize that, that setting. Again, on the right-hand side of Blueberry Drive, as you come up, we have a guardrail on one side. On the other side, on the far side of the sidewalk, we have a split rail fence. Split rail fence gives a little uh, character to that hedge. And then lastly, as we pointed out the last meeting, between lots, actually we call it between lots five and six, uh, off Fernwood Lane, there's a 10-foot easement for accessing the wetland to the rear or the, the open space. And we also have an access along the side of lot one with a boardwalk. That, that again, was part of the previous uh, submittal. There was a question in the package with respect to uh, being either more specific or minimizing the choice of street trees. Uh, we have, uh, as a list of street trees, uh, they're all identified on the plan. All of the circles are drawn. I think the confusion rested in a comment that I had in the packet that suggested that the owners of the property would be adding as part of the understory. and was illustrated in this uh, 3D uh, axonometric sketch. The idea that we have the street trees marching along, and then there'd be an opportunity for planting either ornamental trees, uh, white birch, or whatever, within the front yards and rear yards. Uh, Mr. Fistarchi will be installing red maple, sugar maple, ash, and uh, red oak, as the plan indicates. In addition, we have an island here in the cul-de-sac that will have mixed uh, needled evergreens and a white birch clump for a more naturalized appearance. Thank you. Can you slide the can you slide the lectern back a little? Bit? No, can't do it. No. Um, would the applicant be willing to leave that particular plan with the town, and we can have it in the office for review? Good evening, my name is Joe Fastanchi. I'm the developer of this project. Um, I'd like to respond to a couple of uh, comments that were made by um, Steve Harding, the town engineer. Uh, one, he asked whether a DEP site location of development permit was needed for this project, and Alex Wong at the Department of Environmental Protection assured me that we do not because it is not over 30 acres. Um, the project at no time exceeded 20 acres. There was a question number seven on his uh, list of comments, whether the sanitary sewer service for the residents located at 142 Mitchell Road, uh, owned by the Flocka uh crossed the uh, entrance to this uh, project, uh, better known as the Lonsdale property. And in 1978, I believe it was, um, the previous owner, uh, John Cipriano, um, had the sewer hooked into the Cape Elizabeth sewer, which is immediately in front of the property. So reference to the sewer crossing um, Blueberry Road will be deleted in the next plan. And there is no, um, no sewer line crossing the property at this time. And number three, uh, comment number three that I have is uh, response to his item number 10. 
uh, regarding sump pumps. We believe that the foundations of these properties will be up high enough so that we'll have a positive drain into the storm system. So there'll be no need for mechanical devices such as sump, sump pumps to pump the water out. Um, and that is uh, basically our, our presentation this, tonight. And uh, we, we welcome your comments and hope to uh, receive any input for final, final changes. Thank you, Mr. Pistachio. At this point, uh, we need to review this project for completeness. Are there any discussions or comments? Or? Just a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the storm stormwater issue, the issue of adding the swale on Charlotte Road, I assume that in the application you'll be filing with DEP or that have you already filed it? It's already filed. It's already filed. It does not include that swale, is that correct? That's correct. The, the plans are as you see them before you. Okay. This is something that has come up in comments since we submitted the plans. And so it's, I guess it's, a, it's an issue that, that um, the town's engineer, um, Mr. Harding, brought up. And, uh, Maureen has uh, has mentioned it. Um, we've we've this isn't the first time that it's come up. I mean, we we discussed it amongst ourselves, and we didn't see that there was a need for it. Um, and I guess uh, I still don't feel there's a need for it. But um, uh, if 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 the board feels that it would, um, you know, um, I'm not sure what the term would be. Uh, if if it would help in terms of. Uh, um, Making the neighbors feel more secure about this thing, I guess. Um, you know, we don't feel that there is an impact that is really an increased impact, if you will, that we're creating. But um, if this this seems to be the uh, the way that the board feels we should go, we're we're, we're willing to do that. I guess we just well, want to make sure that you understand that there's a trade-off. Right. If we do this, we'll be we'll be cutting some more trees and doing some more blasting. Right. And and that's obviously a consideration. But purely on the stormwater issue, I would assume that the DEP will look at the stormwater plan as submitted and if it's insufficient either because of the lack of the swale or for any other reason they would let you know is that right sure and, and i i would assume also that the the neighbors who have these concerns would make them uh, you know make them known to dep it is a public process there are notices that go out and they invite comment from neighbors just as the planning board does so it's a similar process in that sense so so they do hear from uh, from the providers I'm sure this has been discussed before, but I just like my memory refreshed. In terms of maintenance on both the stormwater systems and the landscaping, what kind of a plan it will be in place to take care of those two items? Well, the stormwater system essentially becomes part of the roads, so that they're taken over by the town. I mean, ultimately, that's the plan. I mean, the town has yet to. Um, take them over. We have met with the council. They have in concept at least agreed that they might consider that at some future date. But uh, the, uh, the roads, all the open space, the detention basins all become, you know, uh, town uh, property, if you will, at the end of the project. So they are ultimately responsible for maintenance. However, because of the note that I mentioned that is on the, uh, the recording plat, these individual lot owners where these side swales are uh, constructed have a condition on that plan that they cannot obstruct that drainage. So in a sense, they, I, I'm not so sure I'd call it maintenance, but they can't um, do something that would um, impede that flow. In other words, they can't fill it or throw brush there or dump the grass clippings and so forth. They need to maintain that flow across the easement between their properties. So um, there is some responsibility on the lot owners to, uh, to make sure that those those continue to function and I suppose the city also has the right to go in there if they saw something obstructing the flow that they could you know remove that within their uh, their, their jurisdiction is the uh, the owners of the drainage system and the maintenance of the landscaping well the landscaping becomes individual lot owners responsibility I mean, even that along the street well within the street right of way I guess it becomes the 
the, the town's responsibility. They own the right of way. Um, so those trees that are within the right of way ultimately um, are on town property once the, uh, the roads are accepted. Um, so I'm not sure what the town has for a, you know, a, a tree maintenance uh, process. That's fine. Yeah. We're in checking in and testing. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Jones. Could I get a little more clarification on uh, what Mr. Seraldo asked about the, the drainage on Charlotte Street? Maybe you could put up on the board there the uh, stormwater plan that you had when you sure. made your presentation. I don't know if you have available the pre and post development watershed plans. It might be helpful for the yeah, board to see what, what's draining currently and then what is gonna what's the area that's gonna be proposed to be drained. No, it's near the near the back. Uh, I, I don't have the uh, pre development plan mounted on the board, but I do have it in the plans. So I, I guess maybe it, maybe for comparison purposes. Um, This area that's labeled B and it's on number nine. This is the area that essentially drains in the direction of Charlotte Road, which is right here. Um, when we're through with the development, that area B is reduced to this. So that it's basically the backyards of lots 11, 12, and 13, a little side yard of lot. Um, existing lot that's already there. Um, on, uh, I'm not sure what to call this at this point, but uh, we're calling it Red Oak Drive, but it's uh, I think it's Edgewood in the uh, South Portland side. Um, so there's the difference. After development, this is about eight tenths of an acre. As it stands under its existing natural state, it's about 2.4 acres. So that's, um, that's the difference. So I think I think that that answers what I was getting at. So that the acreage draining in the direction of Charlotte Street post development is less. Yeah, it's, it's substantial. As as this plan shows, and were a berm to be installed, they would go from something less to zero. Um, but at the expense of trees, of losing mature trees. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm not sure it would be absolutely zero because we're not going to build a berm, for example, over onto. Um, you know some of these okay. budding lots. Okay, so we don't it would control, but um, it would go to some very it would it would much smaller a little bit more. Yeah, but even without the berm, uh, the plan as designed would still reduce the amount of water heading towards Charlotte Street by I don't know what was the factor that the square about footage half. about half about half. Um, I mean one of the one of the concerns has been about what you know there, there was a letter from the uh, the the city attorney uh, Mary Call in South Portland that raised the issue about us putting stormwater into there. Um, I think her first letter may have said sewer system. I think she corrected that in a follow-up letter and said that she meant the stormwater system. I'm not sure that they may be combined in Charlotte, Charlotte Road anyway, but um, uh, the, it's hard to tell how much actually goes in that catch basin. We included a, a photograph in the um, packet that you all have, and it was taken on a day where there was a little bit of snow on the ground, so it, it, it did help to show the drainage. You could see it a little darker on the landscape, but it's clear that if you go out there, it's an undulating topography, relatively flat, and the water kind of ponds. I mean, it's what we call micro-relief, um, which, which in a sense is a good thing because um, a lot of the stormwater never leaves the site. It, it uh, it's, it's, uh, infiltrates, percolates into the ground, is taken up by the, uh, the roots of the trees and the vegetation. Um, and a certain amount just evaporates. Um, so there isn't a great deal of, of water leaving that area in the first place, my opinion. Um, and we have observed this on many occasions. And uh, there was, I think, a comment in Mr. Bushy's letter that the water would have to pond several feet deep before it could flow into the catch basin. I'm not sure that's true. Um, 
but it would certainly have to pond to a certain extent. And there was a little bit of ponding occurring um, when that photograph was taken. You can see it in the photo. Um, there's some brush and so forth out there now, so it's kind of hard to really get a sense of uh, what's going on uh, if you go out there today. But, uh, believe me, we have looked at this many times, and uh, our opinion has not changed. That, uh, we feel that we're reducing the impact um, significantly, and that the, the point of this berm and the, uh, the additional inlet um, is, uh, you know, overkill, if you will. Um, okay. But we're, you know, we're willing to do it um, if, if, uh, if that's the board's wish. We, we would, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we, we would do that. Well, I don't know if this is the, the meeting in which that, that opinion gets rendered. Um, based on what I've seen so far, it seems like cutting it in half is, is more than sufficient if the if further reductions means cutting down mature trees since there's already a lot of concern about buffering. Uh, on the emergency spillway, would you just trace with your pen in that rare event when the detention pond fills up, where does the water go from the spillway to, to a major drainage conveyance? The blue is the, the detention basins, mm -hmm. uh, which are cross-connected by, by a culvert under the road. We essentially have two that are um, interrelated. The, the general discharge, the, what we call the principal um, spillway, principal outlet, is, is here, and it flows down to Mitchell Road, and then there's a, another um, pipe that goes to the existing culvert that crosses Mitchell Road and goes on down to the marsh. Um, the existing swale, which crosses Wakatula's property, is right here. Um, and we have a constructed um, what we call an emergency spillway right here, which really is nothing more than putting some riprap basically on the existing grade, because this is where the natural you know, um, elevation of the ground is lowest. So when the basin, because it is an excavated basin, not a, um, a constructed by berm essentially, th this is where the water will find its point of least resistance if it gets to that point. And based on our um, analysis, um, you know, I had my engineer check this today. He ran a hundred-year storm through the detention basins to see what would happen, and it didn't rise to the elevation of the emergency still. Uh, it came close, you know, within a few tenths of a foot. So based on that, um, you know, my estimation is it would take about seven inches. A hundred-year storm is about 6.7 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. So if you had seven inches of rain, maybe we would get there. That's a lot of rain. Uh, I've never seen that much. In a 24-hour period, we had an October storm in '96. We may have gotten that much rain, but I think it was over a period of two or three days, which is a lot different than if you get it during a 24-hour uh, time frame. So, I guess the point I was making was that this may happen, but it's not going to happen very often. You know, and if it's, if it's more than a hundred-year storm, I mean, in theory, um, that might not happen in your lifetime. So. If it were to happen, it would follow that existing it would swale. All the existing swale, and then it eventually finds its way into this culvert, which is what's happening now. You know, under the natural situation on this site, the water flows through this this um, open space and the wetland, and it leaves you know through this way. I have a question for the applicant. Um, there's a note missing, the required note regarding the performance guarantee on the recording plats. Was that just an oversight or does it signify an objection? And I believe this re relates to the buffering. Yeah, I, I, I think it was an oversight. I, I guess that's, um, uh, I, I didn't, we didn't prepare that sheet. That was one of, you know, um, Richard Manthorne's sheets, but I, we're, we're going to take care of that and put that on the, uh, 
final version that, that ultimately, hopefully, the board will sign and will be recorded. Thank you. I just wanted to let the board know that the, the deeds that are referenced in my memo have been submitted and they're being reviewed right now by our town attorney. Morning for the record. Um, the permits that are being presently applied for as long as they're being applied for, completeness can be accepted. The, the past practice of the board is as long as they've been in, they've been submitted, you have deemed other applications complete. And in fact, with some applications, um, you've, you've granted conditional approval on the receipt of those permits. Uh, if a permit is not granted or if a permit is granted for a design different from what the board has approved, that means the applicant has to come back. Mr. Chairman, if you agree, I have a motion for the board to consider on completeness. Go right ahead. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Ristachi for final subdivision approval and resource protection permit to construct Blueberry Bridge, a 19 lot subdivision located off Mitchell Road, be deemed complete. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded for completeness. Are there any discussions, any comments? Hearing none, then I'll raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front of the board, please show by raising your right hand. At this point, the uh, application is complete. Uh, is there any further discussion at this point? Chairman, in regards to the need for a further public hearing, it is my opinion that the changes that have come about in this application through the application process were the result of the original public hearing, and uh, that's the applicant and the planning board did indeed request changes in the original application. Uh, it is my opinion that another public hearing is not necessary. I don't want any other... Any feelings about that of uh, other board members? Mr. Child? I, I agree with Mr. Cotter that many of the changes uh, to the plan since the original submission were the result of either public uh, comments at the public hearing, uh, comments submitted in writing from members of either South Portland or Cape Elizabeth since that public hearing or commentary from this board and from uh, town engineer. But given the scope of the project and the fact that there seems to be a lot of, a lot of concern um, and what I see is, is our obligation or at least our opportunity to, to solicit all the input we need to make a good decision, um, I would be in favor of holding another public hearing with the hope that we would not rehash the same old material but try and introduce new and important information. Mr. Shrill. Uh, I guess I, I, I would agree with Mr. Charles in that given the fact that though it was the case that many changes resulted from the public hearing, um, many of the other changes evolved uh, from things other than the public hearing and certainly I for one would like to hear uh, any concerns regarding what in essence is a new plan in many aspects and uh, uh, given the time that's gone by and the changes to the plan uh, I certainly think that we can we can have a public hearing and, and 
still consider the application. I uh, concur with uh, John and Andy on the uh, issue of the public hearing. I guess I would encourage those who wish to speak. Um, you've been very uh, concise in your presentations. I would hope that we would uh, uh, focus on the things that haven't already been a focus of the past public hearings. I know it's difficult to separate them, um, but uh, we certainly appreciate the input that you provided to date and also the fact that you've consolidated your presentations uh, to three or four presenters. It seems like there was an intent to try to get representatives uh, amongst the various uh, members of your community, we, and we appreciate that. I just hope that we uh, could avoid rehashing what's already been gone through uh, before the board. Seeing where that there were, there's been several changes, how, how about a site walk? Is that something that's of value to you at this point? There have been a number of changes, although I assume the site itself isn't going to look all that different from when we were there last time. So I don't know if that's essential. Unless somebody can identify something I'm not thinking of, but the site itself is really going to look the same. Okay. I guess I would concur with the general opinion at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. I believe that uh, we need to let the neighbors, the uh, people in the vicinity, and those that wish to make a comment and discuss this issue. I think it's important to have a public hearing. I think it's it gives an opportunity for those people to uh, say something that's, that would add value to our decision. <coughs> Uh, so I would agree with those board members that would like to have another hearing that uh, we do so. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Where I've just become a member of minority, I have a motion to put forward to the board. Be it further ordered that the above application be tabled to the regular July 16th, 2002 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Motion's been made and seconded. Do I hear any further discussion? Uh, hearing no discussion, I would raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front of the board, please show by raising the right hand. The motion carries. Uh, we will have a public hearing at the next meeting, uh, assuming that we proceed with this project. The last item on our agenda this evening uh, is Laurie Grant, Margaret Littlefield, who have been very patient this evening, are requesting a site plan review to operate a daycare center for up to 12 children in a space previously occupied by Emily's school located at the Methodist Church at 280 Ocean House Road. The plan will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 site plan regulations. If you'd bring us up to date, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Great. You did a lot of the introduction that I, I had written down here. <laughs> but anyways, I'm Laurie Grant, and this is Peggy Littlefield. And as you said, we are um, planning on opening a small child care facility called Ocean House Child Development Center um, at the Cape Elizabeth United Methodist Church. And um, we're planning on being open Monday through Friday, 7 to 5.30. Um, and 
being licensed with the state of Maine for, um, to have 12 children or less who range in age from six weeks to five years of age. Um, we have an agreement with the church to use the space, um, which there's a first option included in the packet. Um, as um, the chair stated, um, the place where we're occupying or planning on occupying was formerly um, occupied by a nursery school, Emily School, and before that another nursery school, Rand Hill Nursery School. So for the past 20 plus years there's been a, some sort of children's nursery school program at the church. Um, we're applying for a site plan review because of the change of use from nursery school to a small child care facility. They, they were there for the morning. A small session will be there for the full day. Um, we're proposing no new renovations or additions. We're using the same classroom that the nursery school used before, um, the same play yard, um, exits, entrances, and lighting, etc. cetera. Um, in the packet, I had, we had included um, the play yard space that we're using is enclosed with a fence. The gate that leads out of the play yard will be secured to ensure that it's closed at all times that the kids are on the playground. The area of the play area is um, 3,384 square feet and that fulfills the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance requirement of 75 square feet of space for a child in the playground. Um, and we're also, um, Steve Etzel from the Administrative Council is here to show the location of the building and the parking lot and the entrance and exits to the roads and to the building and the lighting and, and all of that. So I'll let him speak. I think I'll have to turn this upside down so you can see the on its side. Uh, the church location here. This, this, can you identify yourself, please? I'm sorry, I'm Steve Etzel. I'm the, uh, the chair of the Admin Council uh, Thank you. Uh, at the Methodist Church and actually the interim chair of the trustees as well. Um, and you have a couple of drawings, um, my highly scientific drawings that, the, and that I provided you with. Uh, this is the location of the, of the church currently. This is uh, 77. Uh, Jonesy's garage, just so you get oriented uh, as to where you are. Um, the, the, the traffic flow in this lot is, uh, I guess, historically established. Uh, the entrance is marked at the, uh, the south end, which is a downhill slope. Folks come in and pull into the parking. The marked parking is placed either this way or that way. Um, simply turn around and, and exit uh, here. Uh, excellent site. Um, lines coming out of the exit. The exit is pretty much at road grade, so there's no tilt back of, of the vehicle coming out and so forth. Uh, this is a down slope, um, and this is a, at grade. Um, sight distance is both vertically and, and horizontally are real clear for several hundred feet in both directions. Um, the play area, I think, is, is marked. Uh, again, uh, we thank the use of uh, stickies here. Uh, it's shown on your, your plot, uh, your maps. Um, it's uh, been in place for a number of years. Um, I noticed in the engineer's um, comment as far as lighting, um, we didn't establish foot candle or foot, is that the correct term? Uh, I mentioned at the workshop that the, I'm not uh, an engineer. Um, and uh, I can describe what those lights are. Uh, there's Simple drawings there. Um, there's a, there's a uh, at the door. There's a simple entrance light, which I try to give you some sense of, of the care, of the the coverage of that light. Um, it, it then is the main entrance for uh, the proposed school use here. Um, there's a, a spotlight, which is on a post, and actually uh, I've been at went down it after dark. Just to, again, I have no sense of what foot candles uh, would be, but uh, the light does go all the way across the parking lot. Uh, the effect of that lighting. Um, Nine o'clock at night, I was standing over here to read my watch, and so uh, again, I don't know what that foot candle is. Uh, first, safety. Um, there are two other. There's actually a, a walkway that comes out, which is not used by businesses to, to the entrance to the north of our church. Uh, there are two other smaller. Uh, lights on posts. They're similar to the uh, 
um, downtown village. Street lights, you see, that sort of overlap each other. I uh, have the drawing there. Um, the lighting, the, the effect of the lighting stays on the site. Uh, it's a balance of, of what you folks are looking for, whether it's, it's for amount of safety, so it's well lit, uh, without going over the boundaries of the site itself. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Welcome to, to ask questions if you have any. It seems the only question is about the lighting in, in the comments. And I believe the applicants asked for a waiver, and it seems to me the lighting's been there for a long time. I'm not sure what the problem is. As far as I'm concerned, I think we can just waive it. If I might make a, make a comment on that, I, I think the point is that um, the only thing that I would be concerned is the safety of the children getting out of there at 4 o'clock, and I think you are aware of that, but I think for the record, I think that's why they stated it. Uh, well, that's that's the real concern to lose a little child who runs away from the car in the parking lot in the dark it would would concern me. That's my only concern. Mr. Shrill. Uh, since we're dealing only with completeness at the moment, uh, I think the application is, is sufficiently complete uh, on the lighting issue. Uh, I do share your concern, although I do believe that there were certainly many activities at, this, at the church that took place after dark, even before this use was coming into effect. So. Um, I'm sure it was it was sufficient. So I, I'd like to make a motion Please do. for completeness. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Lori Grant and Margaret Littlefield for site plan review to operate a daycare center for up to 12 children in the space previously occupied by Emily School located at the Methodist Church at 280 Ocean House Road be deemed complete. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. And any com questions or comments or discussions? Hearing none, I will put it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front, show by raising. The motion on completeness, completeness has carried. At this point, uh, we could open it up for further discussion. Uh, some of the issues that are in front of us at this point. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, again, like Mr. Edsel, I am not a lighting engineer. I have attended numerous activities in that church during the evening hours. Uh, the group I meet with quite often congregates in the parking lot after the meeting. I believe the front part of the parking lot is adequately lit. The back part of the parking lot towards the vestry is indeed dark. But uh, where the children are going to be picked up and discharged, the, uh, the lighting, in my opinion, is adequate. I concur with Mr. Cotter's sentiments on that issue. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. One of the other issues that was set forth in the memorandum is whether a site walk would be necessary, and I don't see the need for that in this application. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Maureen, have you heard any comments from neighbors? The only comment we had was from uh, the Chinkettes, and they support the application. So do you think a project of this size is necessary to have a, a hearing? I, I think we I thought we, we advertised a public hearing for tonight. <coughs> no. Hearing is supposed to be scheduled tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the room is overflowing. <laughs> so then we'll open up the hearing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this subject? Please step to the podium. I see nobody rushing to the podium. So I will close the hearing and proceed. So we will continue to discuss the application. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion for approval. Go right ahead. Finding the facts, Lori Grant and Margaret Littlefield are requesting site plan review to operate daycare center for 12 children in the space previously occupied 
by Emily School located at the Methodist Church at 280 Ocean House Road, which requires a review under Section 19-9, Site Plan Regulations. Two, the application substantially complies with Section 19-9, Site Plan Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Lori Grant and Margaret Littlefield for Site Plan Review to operate a daycare center for up to 12 children, <coughs> excuse me, in the space provided previously occupied by Emily's school located at the Methodist Church at 280 Ocean House Road be approved. Motion's been made. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll raise it to a vote. All those in favor of the motion in front. Motion carries unanimously. Good luck on your project. Thank you for your patience. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I, uh, we have some other we have class that work. Oh, yeah, that's not kind of. Oh, it is. Uh, I'm sorry. I can find my paperwork. Uh, okay. Sorry, not. I guess we have one other bit of business to discuss at this point is the Bayview Street vacation. Request by the Town Council for comments from the Planning Board regarding a request by Thomas Panansky to vacate a portion of Bayview Road. It's the same reasons we discussed at the workshop. Oh. He, he, he's, just, he's just saying he's interested in doing it. He has no plans to construct. He just figures that the other section of Bayview Road has been vacated, and why not have this section vacated? Uh, this, this is a draft memorandum that is supposed to encapsulate what you discussed at the workshop, and if it doesn't, um, then feel free to make changes to it. A copy of this was faxed to Mr. Pansky's attorney at his attorney's request. Um, if the board is so willing, you can make any changes you want at this meeting this evening and um, then just make a, a motion to send this recommendation to the town council. I'll put your motion up, please. I remember, if I recall the workshop, one of the issues you raised was that you wanted, I thought that, or somebody raised, was having the setback firmly stated in terms of feet, but did we decide not to go that route? What I did is in the second to the last line, I tried to describe that what you wanted is that the lot owners abutting the vacated street will, uh, where is it? Um, the last line, the planning board is recommending that this additional land not facilitate an expansion closer to the property, property line than what is now possible. Maureen, does that mean they can't expand into that back lot? It means that whatever they can expand now is what they can expand. Okay. And, and the thing is you have to be careful because technically they can all ask for variances mm -hmm. if it's less than a 25-foot setback. But That's true of any lot in town. Exactly. And so what I was trying to do is, is convey the as clearly as possible the concept that whatever they can do now without having the vacation is the only thing they should be allowed to do. I, I thought it was well stated in there. Do I have Chairman, a, I'd, like yes, to, I'd like to move that the memo as written be submitted to the town council. Uh, been moved and seconded to any further discussion? All I can say is thank you, Maureen, Good for preparing it. Uh, all those in favor of the discussion, I mean the motion, show by raising their right hand. The motion carries unanimously, and uh, I guess we're recommending that this pass on to the council forwarded to them in time for the July meeting. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to adjourn. Second it. Motion made, seconded. All those in favor, the uh, meeting is adjourned. Now do we have to do this? Now we're in the workshop? We are going next door. Oh.